Many of you have actually wanted a part 5 of this series to come out as soon as possible. So, I decided to put it into this movie. Have fun. And also, quick little update. If you guys actually want to see all stuff early and everything, just click the membership because I do upload different videos on there if you guys want to watch it. But, that's up to you. And also, quick little reminder, the Hasbro Hotel series I'm doing next time of this. Or the next, well, series I'm doing after this. I'm doing a one shot of Hasbro Hotel, but I'm gonna let you see that for yourself. Enjoy. Video was an average. He was worthless, a complete Deku according to society. In a world where 80% of the population had superpowers, the 20% without quickly became the discriminated minority. This was a harsh fact that Izuku had learned from a young age after being diagnosed as quirkless. Since that day his life had taken a steep dive. He lost his friends, he was constantly bullied, his father left, and now his own mother. The woman he looked up to the most had died, leaving him alone in the world. He sighed grimly as he looked up at the clear skies above him before looking down at the alleyway below him. Juice of Swan Dive Off the Roof is on the plans. Bakugo was right. The teen sighed as he took off his shoes and tied the laces together before pulling out his notebook and writing a brief message. With a resigned and tired sigh, he tossed his shoes at a power line where they wrapped around the wires. A loud explosion rattled the air and his bones as he stared down at the pavement bellow. With a shallow breath, he leapt the pavement rushing to meet him. A sharp, intense pain and crack was felt before everything flashed with static and darkness. With a gasp, he sprung up in a dumpster of all things. Couldn't even die right. Deku indeed. Izuku sighed to himself as he climbed out of the dumpster, only to realize a few things had changed. First being his skin was now a pale bluish white and his uniform now had shredded cuffs. The next was there was no sky, only a rocky red ceiling high above that was partly shrouded with a red mist. Where am I? Izuku asked himself as he took note of the buildings around him, which looked like something from a 20th century rock band cover mixed with American architecture. Hey, you okay there? You're bleeding? A woman's voice asked. Jumping slightly and spinning on the spot, Izuku came face to face with a white-skinned blonde with rosy red cheeks, yellow eyes, black lips, and in a red and black hotel bellhop uniform with black high heel shoes. Embroidered across the left pocket of the uniform was the name Happy Hotel. Her smile looked slightly strained as if something had her freaked out, or she just saw her parents naked. Yeah, that bad. A. Izuku muttered as he brought his hand to his head and felt something sticky there. Pulling his hand back revealed partially dried blood stuck to his fingers. You must have gotten caught up in the purge. Come on, let's get you fixed up. I'm Charlie, by the way. What's your name? The girl gave a grin filled with sharp fangs for teeth, but the nervousness never really left her eyes. Izuku Midoriya, nice to meet you. The greenette replied as he allowed himself to be dragged along by the now definitely less worried Charlie. Um, where are we exactly? Hell, where else, silly? Charlie giggled slightly, making Izuku stumble, and nearly dragged the blonde with him. You okay? H hell, I'm in hell. Izuku panicked, eyes wide in shock. Ah, new arrival then. Charlie nodded with a sympathetic smile. It takes getting used to, well, apparently. I was born here, so just heresy and rumors. So, what did you do to end up here? I, I guess it's because I'm quirkless. Izuku sighed in resignation. I guess Bakugo was right. Quirkless freaks don't go to heaven. Wait, quirkless. That's not a reason to end up here. Charlie stated with a confused frown. Look, let's get you back to the hotel. It's safer than out here. She stated as she eyed the currently empty street. While I believe in redemption, there are some not-so-nice folks around here. Like me. A zombified-looking, green-haired man coughed violently on a cigarette as he slinked out of an alleyway, several random creatures behind him. 
Well, well, well. Looks like it's my quirkless bastard of a son. He spat. D dad, Izuku squeaked in shock. What you do, steal from an old lady. The man snorted as flames flickered around his mouth. Oh no, this is bad, this is bad. Izuku panicked as he pulled Charlie away from his disease's father. So, what was it? The man scoffed. Whatever, still gonna charcoal your ass, you freak. Is that so? Charlie growled as she stopped forward. You'd attack your own son. He's quirkless? The man spat. You are sick. Charlie snarled as her eyes turned red, her nails lengthened into claws, and a pair of horns grew from her head. He is lost and confused, and you want to kill him. Uh, L looked W, we were just joking. One of the creatures, the one that looked like a skinny humanoid frog, stuttered in panic. Sorry for T, the trouble, your majesty. TCH whatever. Izuku's father spat before storming off with false bravado, obviously unwilling to get into a fight with someone much more powerful than himself. You, um, what was all that? Izuku asked in shock. The hotel is just down the street. It'll be safer there. It's almost five anyway, and that's when they start trying to purge everyone. Charlie explained once her features returned to normal. Now come on, we should be able to get you all settled in quickly enough. Thanks. Izuku gave a strained smile as once more Charlie dragged him down the street. While this was happening, his mind was racing a million miles an hour, screaming that he should have just stayed in the dumpster. Of all the things Izuku had expected in life, a hotel located in hell was not one of them. Especially the in hell part, he was pretty sure he would have ended up in heaven or reincarnated or something. He had tried to be good and help others, but apparently it wasn't enough for the big guy upstairs. Vaggy, I've bought a guest. Charlie called as she shoved open the doors to the hotel and hurried Izuku inside. The inside was decorated in various shades of red and black in the style of a 1920s to 1960s high-end hotel with curtains. Sitting at a desk with boots up and reading a comic was a gray-skinned girl about his age with long fanned-out gray hair tied with a red bow, a white shirt that hung on only one shoulder, a red X instead of an eye and a small nose. Charlie. The woman smiled as she looked up only to freeze in fear before vaulting over the desk, drawing a spear from somewhere and holding the tip to Izuku's throat, all within a split second. No funny business, she growled. You um P, put the spear down, please. Izuku gulped nervously as he held his hands in the air. Nervous sweat dripped down his face. Vaggy, relax, he's harmless, just got here too. Charlie smiled charmingly as she lowered Vaggy's spear. You know we don't attack guests. Unless they start it or it's Katie Killjoy. I know, I know my ammo. Vaggy sighed as she slumped slightly before straightening herself up and looking at Izuku. Soy Vaggy cool ease to number. Er, Izuku gulped. Soy ease um, nombro Izuku, he asked butchering the Spanish language. Okay, never speak Spanish again. Vaggy deadpan before turning to Vaggy. So, what's up with the nervous Cenobite? He's a new arrival. He had a small panic attack since someone told him all quirkless end up here. Charlie explained as she put a hand on Izuku's shoulder. His father is down here as a zombie. So how was your life? Faggy asked. You in a gang? Villain stole shit? No, nothing like that. Izuku gave a nervous chuckle. I was actually trying to be a hero and help people. Okay, how the hell did a cinnamon roll like him end up down here? Vaggy asked in complete deadpan and disbelief. A loud explosion sounded from somewhere within the hotel, making Izuku squeak in fear and drop to the floor shaking like a leaf. First of Baxter, Vaggy screamed as her girlfriend began to try and calm Izuku. 
Second off, what the actual fuck is wrong with him? Haven't seen someone react like that since Alistair and Angel Dust got bored. Sorry, Cochin, sorry, Cochin, sorry, Cochin. Izuku kept muttering to himself in shock and fear. Green wisps of fire flickered about his hair, not that he noticed it. Get Angel Dust, as much as I hate to admit it, he is probably the best at dealing with people in shock. Charlie sighed as she hugged the terrified teen before looking back up at her girlfriend, her eyes now red and her teeth sharp fangs. Whoever hurt him is gonna pay. Damn, that's hot. Vaggy muttered with a smirk as she went off to find the local second worst pain in the ass. Angel Dust had been a member of the mob before his death and had easily gained access to hell where he became a spider demon and continued on as normal for the most part. He was simultaneously the hotel's best and worst patient given how while he could get better, he chose to be an utter asshole and sin almost as much as Alistair, if such a thing was possible, that is. Well, 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 what do we have here? A voice that sounded like an old radio asked just after Vaggy left the main room. The Midoriya boy never expected to see him here. Alistair, you know him? Charlie asked in concern. Alistair was bad news, period. He was only kept around as a ditcherant to other troublemakers and to keep the purges from being any worse than they already were. Of course I do. Alistair huffed, sounding offended as he tapped his microphone cane on the ground in front of him. He was on the fast track list to heaven. Why he is here? Well, that is a bit of a shocker. Suicide is a sin after all, and this kid Don goofed. The radio demon gave a large, fang-filled grin. What? Why would he kill himself? Life is so precious. Charlie stated as she softly began to run Izuku's back in an attempt to calm him down and to make sure his flames didn't get out of control and destroy the hotel. Oh, a little angry Pomeranian gave him some bad advice about swan diving and roofs. Alistair waved it off. Point is expect Baxter times ten in a few decades. Anyway, I'm done being helpful so I'm off to see what Nifty is up to, ta-ta. With a red wisp, the main pain in the ass was gone. Sorry, Cochin, sorry, Cochin, sorry, Cochin. Izuku kept muttering as Vaggy returned with a white-furred, four-armed spider demon with a large bust in a pink and white striped suit with black boots a bow tie, four pink gloves, and with one eye normal while the other was black and red. This was angel dust. Nervous breakdown, Vaggy stated. It was triggered by one of Baxter's explosions. Charlie stated from her spot next to the green-haired team. Whoops, now I feel like I shouldn't have given the runt that gunpowder. Angel Dust smirked. So, who's the hottie? This is Izuku, butcher of Spanish. Vaggy stated with an eye roll. Now help him. Yikes, you're being more uptight than the Pope's asshole. Angel Dust snorted as he rolled over Izuku using his foot. Hmm, just mild shock toss him in a room. He'll be fine by dinner for Kane's sake. Need we remind you of our deal? Charlie asked with a raised eyebrow, making Angel sigh. Fine, fine, Ixnay on the explosives. Angel Dust muttered with a roll of his eyes while crossing his arms. So, if he just arrived in hell, how long ago did he die? On Earth. Momo Yayurazu was many things, rich, smart, flexible, and kind. However, she wasn't prepared to watch a teen little older than herself jump off of a building and land headfirst on the sidewalk, their head turning into a meaty pulp. For that reason alone, she quickly made a large barf bag and quickly found she filled it and two more before she could calm herself enough to think properly again. Someone called the doctors, she called as she rushed over to the green-haired boy, hoping in all futility that he had somehow survived. Oh, fuck. She gagged as she saw the brain matter littered amongst the growing pool of red. 
Little did she know, this one moment would be the tipping point that would lead to the change of her being from heaven to hell bound, as she saw a notebook handing off the edge of the railing, its cover burnt. Back in hell, Angel Dust shrugged uncaringly. A, who cares? Not like it'll have far-reaching consequences. Momo growled in anger as she firmly placed the burnt notebook down onto her desk. Sections of the skin on her arms bubbled and sparkled as nesting dolls began to form and drop to the ground. The owner of the journal, one Izuku Midoriya, had been a brilliant analyst and his notes covered multiple ways to help improve on existing quirks and how to counter, and in some cases permanently neutralize quirks and their wilders. In the entire book, there was only three that had permanent neutralization options written down, whereas everyone had a basic countering guide. The first of these was how to counter Endeavor should he ever go on a rampage, using household cleaning products to neutralize his fire quirk and make igniting himself a suicidal move. Then there was someone called Eraser Head who could be stopped with a combination of various techniques and other non-quirk related methods due to the man's ability to negate the quirk of those he looked at. The final one was of a Bakugo Katsuki. This one was the largest set of notes with everything from use of deodorants, cement, full hand covering shackles, how to treat burns he inflicts how to neutralize his sweat-based explosions with baking soda, signs of him snapping, and even his fighting style. It was easy to see the teen was the main bully to the former Izuku Midoriya. What had really made her angry, however, was not just what was in the book, but the fact that said explosive blonde from the book was on the TV being praised for helping fend off the sludge villain from the other month, while said blonde made death threats to Deku, and swore the nerd should return or else. The mere fact the teen had the audacity to say he was the hero was what had set her off. With a frustrated huff, she sat down in her chair, turning the TV off and opening the drawer attached to her desk. Inside was the usual, a few pieces of paper, pens and correction liquid and paper clips. Then there was the small puzzle box her parents had given her for her last birthday. Apparently, they picked it up at an art show from an eccentric collector who had been trying for years to solve it, but never got past the first few steps. With a resigned sigh, Momo picked up the golden box engraved with various symbols and began to turn the faces. A simple tune emerged from the box, played on a mechanism that she could not yet see. Enchanted, she delved further. Though one piece had been removed, the rest did not come readily. Each segment presented a fresh challenge to fingers and mind, the victories rewarded with a further filigree added to the tune. A knock at the door gained her attention, as she put the puzzle down, the tune stopping. Mistress Yeyuruzo, you must leave at once, a man's voice called urgently. Your parents have ordered you come down for supper, as you have missed not only lunch and breakfast, but last night's supper as well. Very well, I shall be down at once. Momo sighed as she stood up, fixed her ruffled skirt and left the room. Happy Hotel. Izuku Midoriya, youngest demon at Hasbin Hotel frowned as he rubbed at his left ear in annoyance. For the past few days there had been an on and off again tune that grew in complexity before stopping. Nobody could figure out where it came from exactly, or why only Izuku and Alistair seemed to be able to hear it, but it annoyed the cane out of them both. With a soft sigh, he pulled out his notebook and began to write down notes of what the hotel security cameras were picking up. Vaggy was on front desk as usual, Baxter was raiding the pantry for snacks with Nifty on her break. Charlie was out front trying to hand out flyers with a board beyond belief Angel and Alistair was standing in the middle of a dark room grinning up at the camera, unmoving as he had been or the past few hours, not even blinking. In fact, if it wasn't for the slight manic twitch of the eye, Izuku would have said the camera was frozen again. With a sigh, he began to write up, what Baxter was taking and making up a list of potential explosive combinations the anglerfish of a scientist could come up with. 
The sudden beeping of a teleportation warning got his attention as a red pentagram and a gold circle appeared in the main lobby. With a resigned sigh, Izuku pressed the intercom system. Everyone, Lucifer and Michael are here. He stated as the mentioned being arrived. Lucifer was a pale-skinned devil with no nose, large horns and fanged teeth, wearing a black business suit. Michael was an almost female-looking angel whose only tell as a man was the simple and neat mustache that adorned his face. On the cameras, Alistair's grin faded in an instant as he hid under the bed, terrified of Michael. Much like most staff and residents, they were afraid of the angel who could, if he wanted, kick the ass of everyone present bar Lucifer. Vaggy sighed as she slumped at reception, and Charlie ran inside with a gleeful squeal of joy. Say what you will about the heiress of hell, but she could get along with just about anybody which really did go to show how much of a bitch Katie Killjoy was. With a slight grunt of pain, Izuku got out of the chair he had been sitting on for the past four hours and made his way to the lobby. During his short time in hell, he had come to learn a few things. First, that hell wasn't just one place, nor was the seven circles of hell accurate. No, hell was a collection of dimensions and pockets of reality that loosely occupied the same area. There was Tartarus, the Greek hell, and home to several imprisoned deities and mid to high level monsters. There was the labyrinth where the thirteen sects and the beasts lived. The fields of glass were a wasteland where giant insects with human faces at all in sight. And then there was the realm he was in, Inferno or Christian hell as Alistair liked to call it, was the most earth-like of the realms, but still the difference was visible, the massive cave roof and floating pentagram on an orb of black stone being the main two. Just as there were different realms, there was different inhabitants too. Demons, devils, deities, monsters, cenobites, and leviathans. That and legion, but nobody was quite sure how to categorize that one not even Izuku. As he arrived in the main lobby with Charlie bouncing excitedly, he was treated to what he was beginning to think was a common sight. Lucifer booted open the west wing doors while Michael pushed open the west wing and the two stormed towards one another. Lucifer. Michael nodded curtly. Bitch. Lucifer snorted. Uncle Michael, Charlie called as she tackled the angel into a hug. She was one of two demons who were allowed to hug the angel, and that was because Michael was her uncle, and he was a sucker of Charlie's charm and ideas. Charles. Michael smiled peacefully as he hugged the blonde back. How are things going with your hotel? Well, okay. Charlie gave a strained grin, making Vaggy shake her head at her girlfriend's attempt to lie to her uncle. There is no need to lie. Not everyone wants redemption. Michael replied calmly. Oh, fucking bite me. Lucifer scoffed. So what are you doing here, feather duster? To put simply paperwork mess up on Miss Azazel's end is why young Midoriya ended up here. Michael stated calmly, Azazel, isn't she the one who keeps following Angel Dust around? Izuku asked, earning a shrug from Vaggy, while Charlie nodded. The deer has gotten into her head to study love from various realms and chose to start with hell. Michael stated with a calm shrug, Is that all? If so, go. Lucifer stated bluntly as he made a shooing motion with his hands. Given it was an error on heaven's behalf, and the work Charlie has been putting in of her own violation, father has decided they can visit earth if they behave. Michael stated simply, Okay, no. Lucifer roared, making Izuku jump in fright and dive behind the nearest chair. No boy is spending time alone with my little girl. They can have a plus one if that is the issue then. Michael smiled calmly as he handed two tickets to each teen. These will allow you in one other smite free travel to and from earth, but not into heaven or holy ground for obvious reasons. Father has an image to uphold after all. Grandpa is so awesome. Charlie squealed in joy. 
I always wanted to see Earth. Izuku blankly looked down at his tickets, not too sure how to feel about it. His life on Earth was horrible, and ironically Hell had treated him better. He had friends who liked him, even if Vaggy never forgave him for butchering Spanish. He jumped slightly when Vaggy laid a hand on his shoulder. Hey, you of all people deserve another chance. Vaggy grinned while Izuku blushed at how close she was. Vaggy as a general avoided males and Izuku could respect that given how she was treated in life, but for whatever reason she acted weirdly around him, and he still had no clue what it was, of all the times. Lucifer grumbled in annoyance as he ran his hand down his face in agitation. Fine, whatever now, why are you here really? I know you would have came just for that, and you were here last month for Charlie's birthday, so spill. No need for violence. Michael placated and a disarming smile. The main reason I'm here is paperwork transfers. Lucifer growled in annoyance as a pair of files appeared in front of him. Cain damned paperwork. He growled as he snatched the floating folders from the air. Both were a simple tan-colored folder filled with white sheets of paper. In one corner the words, In Father We Trust, was stamped above a holy cross, while in the opposite corner the words, Hail Satan, imposed over a pentagram, was stamped along with the usual transference symbol of a sideways crucifix within a circle. One was labeled Minoria, the other Yezorosa. Izuku paced nervously about his room as he double and triple checked he had everything sorted. Book cabinet locked, laptop in his bag, TV off, clothes packed, and importantly tickets in his pocket. It had taken a few weeks for things to settle down so to speak after Michael's last visit. Of course it couldn't fully, it was hell after all. The ones going were Charlie himself, Vaggy, and surprisingly a human. Flashback four days ago. It was an ordinary day at Happy Hotel, or as most called it, has been hotel as a way to mock Charlie and her efforts. Baxter was causing explosions, Nifty was off cleaning somewhere, while Cherry Bomb and Angel was off gambling in one of the unused rooms with Alistair and Lucifer. Izuku was at the main desk with Vaggy, while Charlie was sorting paperwork for a potential redeemed soul called Luna a werewolf who decided she was sick of having to watch her back. Hey, watch this. Vaggy grinned as she scrunched up a flyer for the pizza place down the road. Not that anybody would care they made terrible pizza and tossed it across the room, landing it neatly in the bin by the door which lead to the dining room. Score. Nice shot. Izuku grinned as he high-fived the moth demon. Oh yeah, I'm awesome. Vaggy smirked smugly as the main doors opened and Charlie's pre-recorded song, Inside Every Demon is a Rainbow, began to play before Vaggy punched the recording machine in agitation. Alistair had figured out it could be set off multiple times at once and proceeded to swing to door about like the madman he was. Hi, welcome to Happy Hotel. Izuku smiled cheerfully as a bird-headed being with a small humanoid, yet still bird-headed shadow sat on his shoulder. Greetings, dark prince of torture. I appear to have entered into this realm of nightmare, shadows and sin by accident, while dark shadow reveled in the dark. May I inquire as to your policy on living mortals? The young man, obvious by the voice, asked in a dramatic and raspy tone. You're alive? Vaggy asked with a raised eyebrow. Quirks are getting weirder and weirder, I tell you. She added with an annoyed eye roll. We don't really have a problem with them, or well, most of us in the hotel anyway. Izuku admitted, tactfully ignoring the Prince of Torture line as usual. Ever since Katie Killjoy had revealed his existence at the hotel, the citizens of Hell had two main reactions. Firstly, horror at a Cenobite being inside the city limits the second being to laugh at the idea of a Cenobite wanting redemption. May I ask your name? I am Tokoyami, and this is my companion Dark Shadow, a manifestation by my quirk of my inner darkness. The teen replied dramatically. 
high, dark shadow grinned calmly. One second then, Izuku stated as he turned to the computer. The device was linked to the Hell Registry and had a list of all current and future residents of Hell that currently lived. After a few moments, he finally pulled up the correct file. Let's see, you're heaven-bound at least, so you shouldn't have need of the hotel, no major sins aside being overly dramatic, and once pushing a girl over who called you a feathered freak, you're all good, Izuku stated with a thumbs up. So, what can we help with? Vaggy asked, slumped in resignation. Is there transportation back to the human world? Tokoyami asked while Dark Shadow nodded rapidly. Not exactly. You end up down here, it's forever. Vaggy shrugged. Well, Michael Sama did give us those tickets. Izuku stated. I can use my spare one so he can get back home. You are too bloody noble. Vaggy sighed with a shake of her head. There is a catch. There must be. No prince of torture would ever do such for no blood price. Tokoyami Beckreed. No, just be a good person. Izuku stated, making those present sweat drop at his honest reply. I shall serve you forever, Tokoyami declared loudly as he bowed, his beak slamming into the ground. Would you prefer goat or cow blood, O prince of torture? Why me? Izuku chuckled as his hair caught on fire. The green flames only really showed up if he was experiencing an extreme emotion, in this case, embarrassment. While on the balcony above, hidden in the shadows, Alistair's grin grew shark like before returning to his game of poker. After all, he had to make sure he fully cleared them out, even if it meant getting shot by Angel's Tommy gun again. Back to present. A soft knocking at his door gained his attention. Of all beings in the hotel, only Charlie, himself, Vaggy, and Alistair actually bothered knocking. Angel Dust, Cherry Bomb, and Baxter just slammed or booted the door open. Come in. He called while he continued to go over everything on his list. A nervous habit of his was constantly rechecking everything. You all excited to get back to Earth? Charlie asked with a small smile. Unlike her usual outfit choices of either the hotel uniform or a red and black set of formal clothing. Nervous, actually. Izuku sighed as he closed the lid on his suitcase. I've been dead over a month. It's going to freak someone out, especially if we come across Aunt Mitsuki. It'll be fine. Charlie smiled as she sat down next to him on the bed. I'll make sure of it. Thanks. He gave a nervous chuckle as a familiar tune reached his ears. I just hope nothing bad happens up there. Come on, we're leaving now. Charlie smiled as she got up with a skip in her step. I can't wait to see what Earth has to hold on Earth. Momo could only shake in fear at the beings that came out of the shadows. The music box puzzle had been a trap, a horrible trap. Even the smallest of them had shrugged off being shot by the security on the grounds, and the less said about what they did with the staff she made using her quirk the better. She ran downstairs, hoping to get out of the house and hopefully away from the creatures that appeared. Abruptly she stopped at the bottom of the stairs. Her parents, mangled, bloodied, and twisted almost beyond recognition, laid in a growing pool of blood, her mother's diamond nails quirk still active. Standing above them was a tall figure with pale bluish-white skin, eyes as black as ink. Their body was covered in scars from cuts, punctures, burns, and other unidentified wounds and means. Their body was wrapped in glossy black leather and chains, with six bloody rectangles cut through it and the being's chest. Since that day his life had taken a steep dive. He lost his friends, he was constantly bullied, his father left, and now his own mother. The woman he looked up to the most had died, leaving him alone in the world. Izuku, Charlie, Vagi, and Tokoyami could only scream as they were flung through a vortex of red and black, while shadows clawed at the corner of their vision. 
their luggage gripped tightly in their hands, while Dark Shadow gave a very feminine scream of exhilaration, clutching to Tokoyami's shoulders with an unhinged gleam in its eyes. With a sudden thump, they found themselves slamming into a large bed with messy sheets. A bronze puzzle box twisted into a small monolith sat discarded on the middle, the door wide open and a chair tipped haphazardly in the way. This isn't my house. Tokoyami groaned as he shook his head as if to lessen the dizziness he was experiencing. Then, where are we? Charlie asked as she looked around before noticing the puzzle box. Oh no. Fuck. Vagi agreed as she summoned her usual spear. Um, what is that? Izuku asked as he went to pick up the puzzle box only to receive a small shock. Oh, a lament configuration. Tokoyami stated in shock, his eyes wide. This place is not safe. As if to cement his statement, a scream was heard from downstairs. Without thinking, Izuku charged out the room, ignoring both Vagi and Charlie's words of caution, as the door locked behind him and Tokoyami continued to eye the corners of the room with distrust, his frown deepening as something moved in the shadows. Coming down the stairs, Izuku almost puked at the sight before him. Two dead people in a pool of growing blood as a being from one of the hells dragged a busty black-haired girl closer to him, using a chain wrapped around her throat. She struggled, her hands gripping and pulling the chain, even as they bled, while her feet slowly slid forwards, unable to gain a foothold on the bloody carpet. Let her go, Izuku shouted as he jumped at the young woman and tried to help her pull against the chain. You have no business here, young prince. The being spat in anger. She has opened the gateway and I shall claim my price. The cane you will, Izuku shouted as he grabbed at the chain and began to pull. The lynx began to groan in protest as a sickly emerald fire included his entire skull, revealing the bone underneath as a pair of curved horns grew atop his skull. A mere flame. The child is but a flame user. The being gave a loud, cruel laugh as he still casually dragged the chain closer. How unimpressive. Yeah, fuck you too. Izuku snarled, his voice raspy as the chain began to glow first orange, then white before with a final groan and shriek it snapped making the two stumble slightly while the being remained unaffected. Get your cane damned ass back to whatever area of hell you came from now. The being frowned slightly, dipping his nail-covered head. Very well, I cannot go against the wishes of Her Highness's family, but know this, I will return. They spat before fading into the shadows of the room. Are you okay? Izuku asked the girl who sunk to her knees, shaking fearfully. A nasty red cut circled her throat and jagged cuts marred her hands. Crouching down in the blood, Izuku put his skeletal hands on the girl's shoulders in concern as she stared ahead blankly. Izuku, Charlie called as she rushed down the stairs, a sparking puzzle in her hands with Tokoyami and Vagi fighting off a weird beast that clung upside down from the walls using its legs. She needs to close the portal. Miss, can you close it for us? Izuku asked as he gently shook her shoulders. Miss, please. W.Y. She whispered, her voice shaking slightly. Why didn't you kill me? I'm not here to hurt you. We got here by accident. Izuku stated as Charlie quickly set the box in front of the girl before conjuring her apple-themed trident and rushing back to help Vagi and Takoyami. Can you tell me your name? Any time now, Dark Prince, Tokoyami shouted as he was sent flying by the beast. Momo. The girl whispered, shaking in fear at the sight of the demon attacking the group. W, what are they? Cenobites. Izuku stated shortly, and with no lack of hate for them. Horrible border tribes of hell. Complete the puzzle, and they'll be sent back to hell. Wait, what about us? 
Vaggy asked with a grunt as she appeared the beast in the eye making it shriek in pain and anger. We should be fine. Charlie yelped as she ducked under a swipe of the beast's claws before swinging her trident and removing several of the beast's fingers, making it down in agony. Please, Izuku asked Momo as he gestured to the box. With a small nod, she got to work. Each successful move yielded one less layer to the song which hung in the air, its innocent tune turned sinister by the events it had heralded. How can it send us back, child? We are already here, and now so are you. A mocking and broken voice came from the corner of the room, a being with no lips and barbed wire fusing the nose and eyes wide open snarled. Their form was impossible to distinguish as either male or female and clad in a suit of black leather. Six bloody poles pierces the chest at random intervals with a butcher's hook lodged into the ribs holding them apart. Touch her and I'll rip you to shreds. Izuku growled as the fire surrounding him grew in intensity. Yet another piece fell into place as Momo quickened her pace, not wanting the events to last any longer. The Order of Gash Tokoyami gasped in shock as he tried to pull himself from the crater in the wall. The being turned its attention to the bird-headed teen, tilting its head in curiosity before returning its game to Izuku. We have such pleasures to share if but the girl is given to us young one. Yeah right, I'm not like you. Izuku spat before Re hurling a fireball at the demon who didn't flinch as the green fire quickly ate away at the leather and the left side of its torso. The fire soon died down leaving charred bones and burnt flesh covered in melted leather like cheese on a burger that had been cooked for too long. You are a cenobite, whether you admit to it or not. The flesh does not lie. The being snarled as another part of the tune disappeared from the melody of the music box. No, I'm not a monster. Izuku snarled as several ropes of barbed wire shot from the darkness and wrapped around him. They soon grew red with heat before melting off of him into puddles of iron on the floor. I am a hero. Foolish. The Cenobite snapped as more wire flew at Izuku, all of it melting away as the teenage demon grew closer. A hero never gives up, Izuku shouted as he slugged the Cenobite in the jaw, melting half its head and sending it flying across the room and into the TV, smashing the screen. I will become a hero people can look up to. I will be like All Might and show people they don't need to fear for I am here. He shouted with his raspy voice, his fire glowing intense enough the Momo had to shield her eyes as the cube's pieces finally slid back into position, the Cenobite snarling as it pulled itself from the TV and gave a scream of utter rage which echoed from several locations around the room, whether it was its own scream or the scream of others was impossible to tell. The cube sparked violently and gave off an intense white light as the Cenobites besides Izuku faded from this reality. A dagger of bone and metal thrown from a darkened corner of the room vanished mere inches from Tokoyami's face, making the teen give a sigh of relief. They're gone, Momo asked hopefully, her hand shaking as she dropped the music box like it was a ticking bomb and given the events that just transpired. A mere bomb was a cruel understatement. We should be good. Izuku panted and rasped as the fire began to fade away, leaving him with his usual pale completion and a few flecks of fire in his hair. Are you okay? It can't be. Momo gasped in shock, her eyes going wide. I saw you die. You're Izuku Midoriya, the boy who jumped. We came as soon as we could. A man called as he booted down the front door, almost retching at the stench and sight of so much blood. They were wearing a pair of long black pants and shirt with a grey scarf and yellow vent-like goggles over their eyes. Oh my cane, it's a racer head, Izuku cried out excitedly while Vaggy face palmed and Charlie gave a nervous laugh at Izuku's enthusiasm. Tokoyami could only shake his head as he finally pulled himself from the wall 
Dust covered his feathers, and dark shadow clung to his side in a protective manner. Aizawa was not having a good night. He had been dealing with the brats all day and ended up expelling the entire class which got Nezu on his case. Then he ran into Miss Joke right after his patrol started, and she followed him for a few blocks before he lost her in an alleyway only for her to find him again half an hour ago. Now he was having to deal with a massacre scene. The stench was awful. The smell of molten metal mingled with the stench of blood and fesses filled the air like a thick fog blanketing the room. Oh damn, not even I can joke about this. The green-haired clown gagged at the stench as she repositioned her bandana from over her hair to covering her nose and mouth given that she didn't carry any air filters on her. Note to self, invest in a gas mask. May help in the future. What the actual fuck happened here? Aizawa growled, his eyes flashing red as he glared at the excitable green-haired boy who had called him out by name. You don't want to know. Could someone call a doctor? I think Tokoyami and Momo here need to be looked at. Vagi stated as she gave a flat glare at Aizawa, one he was begrudgingly impressed with. So I'm Charlie, nice to meet you. Charlie smiled as she stuck out her hand at Aizawa. He merely glared at her before Miss Joke tooled her hand and shook it vigorously. I'm the pro hero Miss Joke, nice to meet you. Could you tell us what happened here? The clown heroine asked with a large grin hidden behind the bandana. Your usual portal to hell opening and shit hitting the cane damn fan, literally. Charlie replied casually as she pointed upwards to a ceiling fan that was literally covered in fesses and blood and a small amount of intestine. Me and my friends were diverted here instead of our actual destination, and we saved Momo here from becoming another victim to the Cenobites. Yeah, whatever you be been smoking, stop. Aizawa deadpanned. Hey, Charlie isn't on anything, Izuku called back with his arms folded. Hell doesn't exist, Aizawa deadpanned. Besides, you all don't look like demons. Miss Joke waved it off cheerfully. She is the Dark Princess of Hell, daughter of Lucifer himself. Tokoyami stated, Dark Shadow nodded in agreement. Wait, were we supposed to keep it all a secret or no? Your uncle wasn't clear on that. Vaggy asked Charlie, who looked shocked that she hadn't considered that a possibility, let alone taking into account how religious individuals would react. Izuku's eyes went wide as he started to mutter up a storm before Vaggy covered his mouth, making him stop. Oh man, Uncle Michael will be so disappointed. Charlie worried as she began to pace back and forth running her hands through her hair, nervously making it a mess. Sorry, but what they said is true. Momo shuddered as she made a lead-line briefcase with her quirk and slammed it shut on the puzzle box. The trap in this box opens a gateway to hell. I opened it by accident, and now my family is dead. Hey, it's okay. You had no way of knowing. Izuku told her firmly as he knelt down next to her grimacing slightly at the fact his pants would now be covered in blood. I'm sure you'll see them again some day. Ah uh, yeah, in hell, Vaggy put bluntly. Opening the box is a one-way ticket there after all and well getting to heaven is next to impossible. Stairway to heaven and highway to hell and all that crap. Wait, seriously? Huh? Miss Joke muttered as she pulled out her phone and salad a number. Hey, it's Emmy, could you have a clean-up crew, paramedics, and police to that big-ass mansion in the H.I. Prefecture, the one with the big white wall around it? It's a mess. One survivor and four who got caught up in it all by accident. No, they're alive, too. I only said that because they arrived after most of the deaths occurred. No, I'm not joking. Why you? I am not an old crow. With a snooty huff, Miss Joke hit the end call button and stuck her nose in the air. We sure Angle Dust doesn't have any relatives, Izuku asked Charlie. Positive. 
only child of an only child and the only survivor of a robbery gone wrong. Charlie replied simply, All right, everyone out front. Aizawa ordered as his scarf blew in an unfelt wind. With a resigned Sai Vagi and Charlie followed out Izuku, who was helping Momo along, while Miss Joke helped Dark Shadow stop Tokoyami from falling over. The front of the mansion was no better than inside. Either side of the door two guards were sprawled out across the ground, wrapped in barbed wire and mutilated. One looked to be a base human asides a pair of now shredded bee wings protruding from her shoulders, while the other looked like a humanoid warthog. Oh God. Momo gagged as she struggled to hold her stomach down. T, they had family. Cain damned sadists. Izuku spat as he lead Momo away from the bodies, purposefully moving to block her line of sight to the third body barely sticking out of the bushes. And I, though Voorhees, was a messy killer. Charlie frowned in distaste. They could have at least made the kills painless or quick. This was neither. Tokoyami nodded in agreement with a frown. His arms crossed over his chest as Dark Shadow's form grew from wisp to humanoid in the darkness. Such mad revelry and partaking of sadistic torment is not fit for such a world. Enough with the hell skit already. Aizawa grunted as a distant sound of police sirens could be heard growing closer. There is no such place. Oh, I wouldn't be too sure about that. A female voice tittered nervously making Aizawa jump and spin around, coming face to face with a woman about twenty years of age. Her hair was short and dark brown, a silver halo floated above her head as she wrote down numerous notes on a notebook clutched firmly in her hands. Hi, I'm Azazel, Angel of Heaven. Finish stalking hell, Vaggy asked with a raised eyebrow. Hi, Miss Azazel, Izuku gave a strained grin. While he could get along well with the angel and they often compared notes, he found that her being the reason behind the technicality that lead to him being sent to hell disconcerting to say the least. Oh yeah, got all the notes I need. Cenobites were a bit too much to be around, honestly, but I can safely think I should avoid them. Azazel stated as she briefly glanced about at the group before zeroing in on Miss Joke and Aizawa. Would you mind if I take notes? No problem, oh. Miss Joke grinned widely under her bandana before Aizawa could respond, making the underground hero groan. Thanks, Azizo giggled slightly as her halo wobbled. No lewd thoughts, Charlie admonished the angel. Hell's crowded enough as is. I'm sorry, Azazel squeaked in embarrassment as her face turned as red as a tomato, which she promptly hid behind her notepad. Why do I have a feeling you lot are going to be a problem? Aizawa sighed in frustration as he rubbed at his eyes. So anyway, why are you all here? Miss Joke asked. Here to enslave humanity. Tempting but too much work. Vaggy waved it off. Got into hell due to a filing error. Izuku shrugged. I just want to be a hero who helps people with a smile like all might. I believe everybody deserves another chance. Charlie shrugged with a cheerful grin. Inside every demon is a... No, Vagi and Izuku cried in fear as they both put a hand over Charlie's mouth. Having been on the door shift more often than not for the past few weeks, both were well and truly sick of that song, Mad Revelry in the Darkness. Tokoyami stated shortly while Dark Shadow nodded in agreement. Enough, stop pandering to their delusions, Emmy. Aizawa sighed in agitation. You called me Emmy. The heroine squealed in joy. The present teens couldn't help but snigger slightly at this, even Momo. Fascinating. Azazel muttered attentively as she took more notes. Please let it be Tsukacha's shift tonight. Aizawa sighed as the police cars were finally visible from down the street. Aizawa was many things, resourceful, strict, cat-fanatic, 
a fan of juice and sleeping bags, but religious was not one of them. He kept repeating the mantra to himself, but the fact there was literal demons and an angel in the interrogation room at the police station was starting to get to him. Not only was hell a place, it was several dozen separate realms of torment, suffering and punishment amidst realms of chaos and disorder. Apparently the main group he was dealing with was from Pentagram City, roughly four hours flight by wings from the center of all the mess. According to Azazel, the main realms of hell included Necropolis, Tartarus, Pentagram City, Imp City, Argent Dinner, Void, the Labyrinth, Fields of Glass, Inferno, the Underworld, a realm that sounded like someone hawking a loogie at a fast-spinning fan, the Night O Sphere, and finally Shul Nagarxert. From those main ones, there was hundreds of offshoots each. Heaven, thankfully, but also sadly, didn't need much room and consisted of just three realms, Paradise, Nirvana, and Heaven itself. The fact that so few actually got in was a bit disheartening for the hero, especially the part where most religious people didn't get in due to petty squabbling over which book was right. Apparently, there was a short list of a couple hundred each decade or so that got in. He was just happy to know his mother got in, somehow. So, you okay, Shota? Miss Choke asked with a grin, her hand resting on Aisawa's shoulder before he shrugged it away. Ah, come on, she whined playfully. The fact we have honest-to-God demons here is brought to worry about with you being here. Aizawa deadpanned at the green-haired hero. Come on, now you're gonna say you forgot about our date tomorrow at the movies. Miss Joke sulked playfully. We have a date at the movies, Aizawa asked in shock. Great, see you at seven, Miss Joke called as she rushed off. Damn that woman, Aizawa growled in annoyance. Oh man, that sucks. Vagi laughed from the cell across from Aizawa. Charlie got me the same way. Quiet, Aizawa grunted, just saying, If she is anything like my Charles, she will keep going until you say yes. Vagi sighed, Pretty sure your only other option is to hide under a rock. I have a sleeping bag, Aizawa stated simply. Next, a detective sighed as Izuku was escorted out of the interrogation room and put into the cell next to Vagi with Tokoyami. Charlie and Momo were still being interviewed since Momo was the main one affected and Charlie was the most knowledgeable about Cenobites and Hell although Izuku was a close second. Behind them, nearly groaning under the weight, a cart was wheeled out of the room, covered in sheets of paper. Yeah, yeah, keep your pants on. Vaggy sighed as she backed away from the door to the cell and held her hands up. Still can't believe we have to interview dead people. I mean like she was found dead years ago, after a drug-odd rape. The cop was cut off by a swift punch to the face from Vaggy. Aizawa instantly restrained the demonic girl with his capture staff. Inunka vulva a mentionar iso, Vagi snarled as she struggled against the bindings. Calm down now. Aizawa growled as an officer with a pig head dragged away the unconscious cop. Vagi calmed down. He didn't mean it. Izuku called to the struggling girl. Truly a sad fate. Tokoyami sighed with a shake of his head. Having never heard how Vagi had died and ended up in hell, it was a bit of a shock to the bird-headed teen to find out how the broody girl died. Few to do ease culpa de cerdo, as he quit, see few una chica lamada, no tinia opsion. Vagi screamed as tears fell down her face, and like a dam bursting, she fell into sobs. Anyone speak Spanish? Aizawa asked with a sigh as he pinched the bridge of his nose. After nobody spoke up, Aizawa just sighed and dragged the sobbing demon teen into the interrogation room, hoping someone there could speak Spanish. Of all the languages he knew, Japanese, English, Russian, German, and Polish, he never considered Spanish annoyingly enough. How come I'm not in a cell? Azizel asked from her waiting chair against the wall. 
The police are but corrupted fangs of a wicked beast only biting down that which it fears. Tokoyami stated as he folded his arms. Translation, Azazel asked with a wavering smile. Her notebook clutched nervously in her hands. The pen was confiscated for security reasons. He is saying the police are biased. Izuku stated as he sat down on the simple cot in the cell. Oh, Azazel uttered with a blush. Despite spending as much time as she had skulking about hell, the angel was still for the most part pure, if a bit perverted at times. Apparently she had been banned from Shul Nagarksert after she annoyed too many demons with her questions, which was saying something for the city of forbidden knowledge. Takoyami, your parents will be here to pick you up in half an hour. One of the officers called as they stuck their head out of one of the side offices. Dark forces are cruel and unusual with their punishments. Tokoyami slumped in defeat. Suffocation seems assured. Hug happy parents, Izuku asked with a soft smile. Tokoyami seemed to blush slightly before giving a small, short nod. B. Before her death my mum was like that too. May she rest on eternally. Tokoyami stated with his head bowed. So, what's her name, your mother I mean? Azazel asked, and she absently tapped at her notebook. Oh, she's in Komiteria, do you know her? Izuku asked hopefully. Azazel only turned pale as a sheet and let out a strangled yelp before her eyes rolled back and she passed out cold. Azazel-san, are you okay? Izuku called in worry as he tried in vain to reach through the bars to check on the normally cheerful angel. Great, got a fainter here. The officer from before called lazily. A few moments later, a tall woman with white hair and a single blank eye sighed as she walked over. She placed her hand over Azazel's head and jerked back as Azazel shot up with a squeal of shock. Marvin, you owe me ten bucks. The officer called as she wandered off the way she came, trying to ignore Izuku's mutterings about her quirk. All it did was give her the ability to wake people up, and gave her only a grey eye that let her see better in the dark. That was it. Gambling is a sin. Azazel stated softly as the officer walked away, snapping Izuku from his mumbling rant. So, uh, why did you freak out about my mum? Izuku asked. No reason none whatsoever, no, sir. Azizo pelted out in panic as she tucker her legs up to her chin and began to rock slightly on the spot while mumbling, Never anger, green lady. Never anger, green lady. Yeah, that's mum all right. Izuku gave a nervous chuckle as he rubbed the back of his head. His mum was a downright lovely lady and would go above and beyond to make people happy, but Cain forbid you made her mad. He had only seen it twice. The first was when his father tried to abuse him for being quirkless. Officially he left. Unofficially the man got an early trip to hell. The next had been when a man with a potato-like face had tried to demand something from her. He had no clue to the specifics of the conversation, only that the man fled using a purple portal in a hurry with half the kitchen cutlery being flung after him by the irate mother. All right, this is ridiculous. Momo huffed as she was lead to the cell Vaggy had occupied and shut in, a pair of quirk negating cuffs on her wrists as an officer slid the briefcase containing the lament configuration into the cell with her. I keep telling you to destroy it. It is just a puzzle box. The officer sighed in annoyance, probably having said it a dozen times. There is no way it could have did what you said. In all likelihood someone with a portal quirk dropped villains on your house, and it was all bad timing. Ignorance is but a fatal folly. Tokoyami stated as he shook his head as the officer walked off muttering about superstitious children. I'll happily melt it to slag when we get out. Izuku offered Momo. No way can those maniacs be let loose on earth. Elsewhere a short, ball-haired boy giggled pervertedly as he dragged yet another body onto the sigil. 
His parents were the first to go then Kirishima, and that old man who always stopped him peeping on the girl's locker room. His hair balls as it turned out if microwaved would shirk, but rapidly returned to their proper size of four-inch diameter when wet, so sneaking them into the food of his targets had been easy. As he dropped the final body, the sigil flashed and the lights went out. You are not my Izu Kun. His screams of pain were heard by no one, and the bodies weren't found for another six days until the smell leaked out. Yet another elsewhere, a pink-skinned teen shot up in shock from her head, her gold and black eyes quickly adjusting to the dark room. The queen is here. A quick series of thuds filled the air. Mina go to sleep, it's almost midnight. Sorry, Dad. Of all things, Charlie was expecting Earth to be like a near replica of Hell Minus, the religious iconography, stone ceiling and fire, wasn't it? In fact, the streets seemed to be cleaner in Hell asides, the back alleys they would pass on occasion. Momo being the sole survivor of the Cenobite attack on her family, and the last remaining Yayuruzo, was set to inherit her family's business of hero gear and support item manufacturing, so she had talked at the police station with her family lawyer, who would try to sort everything out for her. Tokoyami was being escorted home by his parents, and that left the residents of Hell, a love-obsessed angel and Momo, to be escorted by Aizawa. It was almost midnight when a bus arrived at the station being driven by a short old lady who was using stacks of books to reach the pedals. A large syringe like cane sat to her side. After being piled onto the bus, the old lady took off like a bat from hell for a distant H-shaped building. So, where are we headed? Izuku finally asked while Azazel and Momo were discussing ways to destroy the lament configuration without causing an explosion. You are Academy, young man. The lady stated simply as they slowed to a stop at some traffic lights. You are Academy, as in the best hero school in Japan. Izuku cried out excitedly as green flames sparked from his hair. Calm down. Aizawa grunted, partly annoyed that his quirk had no effect on demonic abilities, and thus couldn't shut down Izuku's fire. For all I care, you'll still be out on your ass by the end of the night. Technically it's morning, Charlie asked as she motioned to the digital clock attached to the bus's radio. Indeed, it was showing 12.01m. Quiet. Aizawa grunted in annoyance only to wince in pain as the old lady whacked his across the back of his head with a cane. Don't you complain, Mr. Go to bed at the crack of dawn? I've been up since six this morning dealing with Mirio and Nejar's antics. How they managed to dislocate both shoulders just by walking is a bloody mystery. The old lady grumbled as they pulled up to the gate to Yua as the main gate slowly opened. Not like you have classes for the rest of the year besides Fridays now anyway. They had zero potential, Aizawa explained bluntly. Wow, and I thought heaven was strict. Azazel muttered softly as she wrote another couple lines of notes. Wonder if my uncle still works there. Vagi muttered. Your uncle? Izuku asked uncertainly. After all, Vaggie had stated a few times how her family had treated her. Hisashi is technically a fifth cousin twice removed, but it's easier to call him uncle. Vaggie shrugged it off. Momo cast her a sidelong glance from the other rows on the bus before going back to trying to figure out how to destroy the puzzle effectively. Great, more family. Aizawa sighed as he hit his head against the pole in front of his seat. With a lurch, the bus finally continued on its way to the main campus of the school, specifically Jim Gamma, where more staff were waiting, many of whom were looking annoyed at being woken up at the ungodly hour. Everybody off. The elderly woman smiled softly as she pulled the handbrake and opened the door. You too, Aizawa, you're not sleeping on the bus again. Make me. The hero deadpanned. The threat of a raised king quickly got him moving, however. Fine, he huffed. Welcome to Yua Academy. 
Am I a mouse, a cat, a bear? Nobody knows, but I am Nezu, the principle of you are. All items of otherworldly nature need to be checked over before you enter, though, just for safety. The small man, bear, mouse, cat thing called in a cheerful tone. You can't seriously believe the demon skit, can you? A block-headed man grunted tiredly. Oh, oh, introductions, Charlie sang happily. Oh, great, she's singing again. Izuku sighed. Charlie, please no singing, it's too late. But Blonde stopped and pouted before giving a resigned sigh and nodding. Wow, look at that. Vaggy smiled. You got her to stop singing before she started and without kissing her. At that, Izuku blushed and his hair burst into flames. It's not like that, he squeaked. Hey, no need for that. Charlie admonished them. I'm Charlie. The other blonde is my girlfriend, Vaggy. The blushing green-haired kid is Izuku. She is Momo, and that is Azazel. She finished painting to Azazel, who was behind cementos and taking notes. The block-headed man jumped in fright, clutching at his chest as his heart skipped a beat. Hi, I'm Azazel. The angel smiled nervously as she got behind her notebook. I am a fan of your architecture. My house in heaven is modeled after it. Can I have an autograph? She asked, holding out the notebook and her pen that Momo made for her before since she never got back the one that was confiscated. Ah, uh, sure. The hero muttered in cautious confusion as he signed the book. With a squeal of joy, it was snatched back and the angel held it to her chest while her face turned bright red and her halo wobbled. Off track. Nezu stated simply as he gestured to a table to the side. All non-clothing items there, please. Oh, sure, Izuku stated as he turned out his pockets, putting down his ticket. A few spare coins from hell, a pencil, two notebooks, an eraser, a bobble head of Katie Killjoy that looked like it had been used for fireball practice, and half a stick of gum before putting his suitcase of clothes on it, too. Vaggy just rolled her eyes and placed her suitcase and spear on the table, ignoring the shocked and horrified look her normally very vocal cousin was giving her. The blonde human was for once in his life speechless. Charlie simply put down her suitcase and tried and before Vaggy cleared her throat. With a sigh, the princess also put down her phone. Momo cautiously put down the suitcase containing the lament configuration and using her quirk quickly made a roll of hazard tape and wrapped the box in it. And in there? Nezu asked as he gestured to the now bright yellow case. A gateway to hell that will summon some of the nastiest pieces of work you'll never conceive or believe of being capable. Izuku stated solemnly, we just got out of dealing with them earlier. I, if it is all right, may I share with someone for the foreseeable future? Momo asked hesitantly. That would depend on whom you are asking about. I cannot allow you to share the room with a teacher after all. Nezu stated seriously. You can think with us. Charlie stated softly as she pulled Izuku and Vagi to her side, making both blush brightly at the close contact and what was being said. I mean, no offense. Momo trained off looking uncertain. Charles, she just had a run-in with border demons. She doesn't need to bunk with the more powerful versions. Vaggy stated simply as she slung her arm over her girlfriend's shoulder while Izuku tried to slink off. Where do you think you're going? Tea to bed. The green-haired demon asked nervously, his face still beat red. We don't know which room the three of us are in. Vaggy grinned teasingly making Izuku faint due to a powerful blood nose. Ee ee, Midnight squealed in joy. Kinky demon threesome, can I join? No sex worth for teachers in the dorms. The old lady snapped as she ditched her cane at midnight, hitting her in the head before bouncing back to the old lady's waiting hand. Elsewhere, a low groan echoed through a small alleyway between a series of high-rise apartments. 
A young girl with long hair limped out as they held their abdomen in pain. Blood dripped from her mouth that did not belong to her. I think the pervert is repeating on me. Irk. A quick hunch behind a pile of trash bags and the sound of splattering and puking filled the air before she straightened back up, wiping away the blood and bile with the back of her hand. Why did I go to hell? Surely father is just testing me. But what I did after to the one who killed me, am I truly a monster? How long was I even gone? Is it even the same night? Why am I so hungry? She muttered as she staggered along. Who is Izu Kun? Happy Hotel. Alistair was confused as he looked about the empty room with a chair sitting empty in the middle. Where the fuck did that nun I was brainwashing go? The dim buzzing of a light bulb was his only answer. Fuck I'm bored again. Thank you all for watching the video and bye boys. Achievement. The fact Charlie seemed to keep going was just the icing on the cake. Like you wouldn't believe, I love her, but she never seems to get tired until it's bedtime. Faggy panted. At least she isn't singing right now. Izuku shrugged as he rolled onto his front and pushed himself up, staggering slightly as he did so. The flames that engulfed his skull was wavering like mad, even though his skull was visible and his pale hands were bright red from the last exercise of push-ups. He still managed to help Vaggy to her feet and help her off the track just as Charlie came around for her 95th lap. Sitting down in the shade with a half-empty bottle of water was Momo, she was bright red and exhausted after only managing 17 laps around the kilometer long track, 621 miles long. I say we put sleeping pills in her next drink. Charlie stated bluntly, that or that stuff Baxter made. We are not turning Charlie into a sex crazed maniac. Izuku deadpanned at an unashamed vaggy. Hey, she certainly didn't complain last time. Vaggy snorted as Charlie tripped halfway through her 96th lap and started snoring. Cute. Vaggy whispered in awe as the heiress of hell slept peacefully. At least Luna isn't here. Izuku deadpanned, unaware of a slaughter said werewolf was helping with in America. Way to kill the mood. Vaggy sighed as she flatly stared at the flaming demon. Quit arguing, it's distracting. Nezu grunted as he marked off a few things on a clipboard. Now, let's see what's next, shall we? Hum, oh. Well, all done then. You almost gave me a heart attack. Vaggy groaned tiredly as she stumbled over to the shade next to Momo. Without a pause, Momo handed the exhausted demon a bottle of water. Well, that concludes the entrance exam. Nezu chuckled aloud, drawing looks from the two demons and one heiress. Why else do you think I had you doing all of that exercise? You have a special spot at the hotel when you die, rodent. Vaggy growled while Izuku gave an exhausted sigh as he rubbed at his forehead. Nezu ignored them as he cheerfully hummed while walking away. Dinner is being held in the common area tonight in dorm one a given the previous tenants are expelled. Pick your rooms while I sort out your paperwork. The principal called back with a dismissive wave of his hand. The other exams start in two hours, so stick around and watch if you want to, Tata. Again, special place at the hotel, like door greeter. Vaggy growled. Maybe we could have Alistair swing on the door again. For once I agree. Izuku sighed with a slump in his posture, the flames on his skull finally extinguished as his muscle, then flesh knit itself back together like some form of reversed incineration. With Bakugo. Bakugo growled in anger as he sat on the bus to Yua Academy. Stupid bitch of a mother, stupid father, stupid fucking Deku for jumping. He had to sort through all his crap in the spare room for fuck's sake.
Across from him, a vine-haired girl in a tattered white dress couldn't seem to make up her fucking mind. She kept opening the lid to a container, then snapping it shut again while scrunching her eyes and taking deep breaths. Oh man, the fuck up. Bakugo snapped in anger, making the girl jump slightly. Nobody is going to fucking give a shit if a shitty extra like you eats or not. I I see. The girl nodded as she opened up the box and pulled out a hunk of raw meat which she proceeded to place delicately in her mouth before chewing. Fucking extras. Bakugo scoffed. You better not sit near me during the exam's meat breath. I'm sorry, I can't help it. The girl muttered around the meat, blood dripping down her chin, which she quickly wiped away using a vine. Bakugo barely noticed that the vine itself was covered in a lot of dried blood. If it didn't involve killing villains, himself or his mother, he didn't tend to notice anything. Further down the bus and out of sight, a pink-skinned girl sniffed the air curiously before looking around, trying to figure out what smelt so good. Whatever. Bakugo scoffed as he stood up. Move your shitty-ass tree face, we're here. I have a name, you know. The girl sighed as she packed away the small box into a bag filled with several more boxes. While she did regret killing the pervert, her vines demanded substance and better a sinner than a saint. And I don't care. Bakugo scoffed as he watched ahead. The bus jolting slightly as it passed over the Uabara, which went retracted, was little more than a speed bump. When it comes down to it, I'll be number one, not some extra. Elsewhere, Nimuri grinned in anticipation at the being standing before her. Lucifer grinned back at the woman laying before him, legs spread wide. His wife Lilith licked her lips next to him as she massaged at his shoulders. Do we have a deal? Nimuri asked. For sure, my dear. Lilith smirked as she sauntered over to the purple-haired woman. One night with us in exchange for some of that lovely shampoo your company makes without having to break the bank, so to speak. Kinky demon threesome for the win. Nimiri cheered as she pulled Lilith onto the bed. Lucifer's grin grew. That is some kinky shit. Redacted, Nimiri twitched slightly as she laid on the bed basking in the afterglow while Lucifer laid to her left smoking a cigar. Lilith on her right was passed out with a content grin. Well, my dear, in advance, welcome to hell. Lucifer grinned. Worth it. Nimuri grinned before a knock was heard at the door. Nimuri, hurry up. We have an exam to grade. Snipe called from the other side of the door. Nimuri bolted up in shock. Time flies when you have fun. Lucifer chuckled as he picked up his wife and vanished in a puff of red. One minute, I need to get dressed, she called as she bolted for her cupboard. To much information, Snipe shouted before storming off. Fuck, Nezu is going to kill me. Nimuri panicked as she struggled to put on her leotard. Back with Bakugo. The explosive blonde growled in anger as he waited in exam area B for the test to start. Some blue-haired brat wouldn't leave him be, and it was getting on his nerves. At least the vine-haired extra wasn't around. The gates opened with a grinding clunk. Without waiting, he shot through using his explosion, uncaring that he took one examinee's arm clean off or burnt the face of a brown-haired girl with a bob cut a burn that would ultimately leave a scar over her left eye. What are you waiting for? There's no countdowns in real life. Go, go, go. Examine 1E329 and 1E372. We have medical bots on the way. Present Mike called out over the paw system. I'll continue. The bobcut girl called as she raced into the test area with the others, uncaring of the pain plaguing her face, she couldn't let anyone else get hurt. In the observation room overlooking the test area, All Might grinned to himself like a giddy schoolgirl, just as Nimri burst into the room barefoot, her shoes held in hand. 
Ah, now we are all here, let us truly begin. Nezu cackled to himself. Been a while since we awarded persistence points, but I believe 1372 deserves some. All in agreement? Yes, was the general answer aside from Aizawa. Illogical. She is injured and needs medical attention. How can she save someone or stop a villain if she is half blind? Either way, that still brings it to four out of five points for her actions. Nezu stated simply, Keep an eye on the one that harmed her, however. I have a feeling our new juice will want to have words with him. To say the exam was unique would have been a gross understatement. Not even the normally sadomasogenous Kayama had much to say. One girl was fighting with half her face burnt. The blonde who did it was bezerking on the robots, and a vine-haired girl was racking up points fast enough that the robot's secondary programming to go after the largest threat had overloaded causing them to go to the nearest source of noise. So, all in agreement that blonde asshole will be handed over to either the cops or hell, Vlad King asked in a bored tone. Agreed. Almost everyone replied in unison. Only Nezu and Recovery Girl said nothing. Nezu because he still wanted to see where things went and Recovery Girl because she was biting down on her cane in anger, using it as a gag to stop her screams of anger ringing out through the school. It's illogical not to just call the police on this one. Aizawa droned from his sleeping bag, a juice pouch in his grasp. Kachin never went this far before. Iziku admitted softly as he entered the room with Charlie and Vaggie under escort of Lunch Rush, who handed a pouch of juice to Aizawa and a thermos of coffee to Snipe, who was sitting quietly in the corner of the room, watching the monitors and occasionally marking something down at a computer. True, but we can't interrupt the test without having to retest everyone unless he attacks another applicant again. Nezu stated bluntly, you know the HSC is just wanting to jump in and take over the school. Stupid pencil pushers. Nimiri grumbled in annoyance. On more than one occasion the HSC or Hero Safety Commission had tried to interfere outside their preview such as with the school which fell under the education board or in Hero's private lives on numerous occasions even without merit. Nimiri herself had a personal grudge against them after they blacklisted her original hero costume and later did the same to her second one. She didn't get what the problem was. Linger was clothing, hence she wasn't naked after all. Charlie nodded empathetically as she patted Nimiri's shoulder. Tell me about it, the amount of bureaucratic bullshit I had to go through to open the hotel was insane. I'm still surprised that you managed to get it all done in a week while Vaggy and I struggle with the damages list for just one week. Izuku sweat dropped. Shush. Tired. Vaggy groaned as she tried to get to sleep on one of the chairs in the corner. Aizawa nodded in sympathy with the moth demon. Test arena B. Ibarra panted as she squeezed her vines together, causing a dozen or so robots to come crashing down from above, breaking on impact with the ground. That lot alone should be about another 13 points to her total. While it was helpful, the majority of her points had came from rescue points, mainly by pulling others out of the path of danger or swatting aside fallen debris. Not that she knew it. To her knowledge, she was only on 28 now. Listen up contenders, only five minutes left. Present Mike called out over the intercom system, installed over the fake city, making many students start to hurry up or panic. 42. A blonde teen with a jeweled belt called in a French accent as he rushed down the street and into an alleyway. 39. A brown-furred teen who looked like a Sasquatch called as they ripped a robot in half. Make that 41. 59. A ginger-haired girl with large hands called as she rushed down the street in the opposite direction to the initial teen. Ibarra gulped nervously. She had only gotten a few in comparison to the others. 
Her hair twitched in irritation as she rushed off to find more robots, only to find herself back on the main street of the false city, which was now littered with the husks of the robots destroyed earlier. The sound of crunching and grinding filled the air as contestants began to scream and run past Ibarra, who whipped around in confusion before freezing in shock. A massive robot with treads was plowing straight down the main road, flinging debris everywhere. Something shot towards it only to be swatted aside. A shout of pain got her attention as dust kicked up from one of the fake cafes. A bloodied arm was sticking out of the rubble. Her eyes went wide as she sprinted forward, her vines helping to propel her along. Hold on, I'll help you. Ibarra smiled softly as she grabbed the hand and removed the concrete using her vines. Staring up at her while growling was the same blonde teen she sat next to on the bus. He was bruised and covered in scrapes and dust, but looked fine asides the unnatural positioning of his thumb, which was twisted. Fuck off shitty hair, the teen shouted. I was just trying to help. Ibarra replied as she tried to pull the teen out only to receive an explosion to the face. With a scream on pain, she fell back as the cement slab fell back onto the teen's legs. You shitty ass bitch. The blonde screamed right before a massive explosion burst forth from him, collapsing the buildings and sending Ibarra flying across the street. In time, present Mike called out as the robot froze. Its arm was mere feet away from the blonde teen's location. Everyone leave the test areas and head back to the buses. Arena B and D, rescue will arrive shortly. Ibarra could only groan as she pulled herself from the rubble. Her dress was shredded and some of her vines were torn. A cut was across her lower lip from which a steady trickle of blood was seen with the local demons. Izuku frowned as he was rushed down to Arena B with Snipe by an intern called Yogi, who was driving them by golf cart of all things. Charlie, who was still full of energy, was rushed to Arena D with Cementos after a building collapsed, trapping the teens inside the arena. Cementos was there to clear the mess while Charlie was carrying a first aid kit given Recovery Girl was off to Arena O with Hound Dog. Only Arena C had nothing bad happen, but Lunch Rush was still headed there to hand out drinks anyway. When they reached the arena, Izuku was somewhat impressed and shocked at the amount of destroyed robots. Snipe immediately rushed to the collapsed cafe where the blonde had been pinned, while Izuku brought the first aid kit to the vine-haired girl. Are you alright, miss? he asked as he stopped next to her. Huh, she asked groggily as she blinked lazily at Izuku. She sniffed the air briefly. Izu-sama, she uttered before collapsing into Izuku's arms. Yogi-san, call ahead, she may be concussed. Izuku called back at the skinny man who nodded seriously and pulled out a flip cell phone to dial a number. Returning his attention to the girl he couldn't help but notice how much blood was on her skin and what was left of her vine-like hair. Better call Recover Girl, too. It had been an absolutely piss-poor day for Mina Ashido. First she slept in and missed breakfast, almost missed her bus. Kirishima still hadn't returned her calls from last night, and to top it all off, she had been placed in the same exam arena as a flamboyant blonde who went around copying everybody's quirks, and then had to gall to insult her when he couldn't copy her. Not her fault that her quirk was nothing more than her demonic heritage. Apparently her mother had brokered some deal with a high-ranking angel in order for her to stay on earth, even though she herself was stuck in hell from the time she had turned two. Now to top it all off, she was stuck waiting for someone to clear the massive doors into the arena after the conjoined twins went berserk on the zero pointer and threw it at the doors which brought down two buildings once they were covered by its shadow. Currently she was sitting atop a three pointer that one of the kids disabled by making it malleable and unable to support its own weight. Dark one, we request a seat. The bird-headed of the conjoined twins stated in a blunt tone, Sure, I'll budge over, name's Mina Ishido. 
She gave a cheerful fanged grin as she slid aside. I am Fumikich Tokoyami. The teen replied as he sat down next to her. And your sister? Mina asked after a few moments of silence. The bird-headed teen merely looked confused. You have a mutation quirk that gives you a bird head and your sister is a sentient shadow. She deadpanned. Is that true? Tokoyami asked as the bird-headed shadow materialized on his shoulder, nodding sheepishly. Why didn't you ever tell us? I'm shy. Confrontation never solves anything. The timid shadow replied as its form wavered in the sun. I must confess this is news to me. I wonder if mother and father know. Fumikage hummed to himself, while his twin merely shrugged before vanishing only to reappear sitting atop his head. Everyone back from the rubble. A voice called loudly from the other side of the wrecked buildings. A few moments passed before with a grinding crunch, the building slowly sank into the ground like kinetic sand melting into a puddle, but fast forwarded. Standing there with hands on the ground was the pro hero Cementos, a man who had a block shaped head with a simple ponytail and four blocky fingers on each hand. Next to him was a white as snow skin teen, who looked to be their age with long blonde hair done in a simple plait that reached their ass wearing black jean and a white button up shirt. A simple first aid kid held in her hands, her red eyes scanning the area for anybody who needed help as she rushed into the arena, stopping briefly to give band aids to those with minor cuts and bandages to those who had worse like the short girl in the dress who defeated the robots she had came across by making mushrooms sprout everywhere inside them. Mad revelry, Fumikich uttered, so much wounded. The mad revelry indeed. His twin agreed in shock. Since when the fuck did the princess have permission to visit Earth? Mina muttered, ignoring the twin's looks as she jumped off of the malleable lump of robot and made her way to the blonde who was helping bandage a cut that went down the leg of a kid who could climb into shadows. Okay, just keep off of it for a couple hours. You should be good by then, I think. She uttered, making Mina shake her head. I'm sorry to say, your majesty, but humans don't heal that quirk. Mina explained only to jump back to avoid being brained by the medical tin. Peace, peace. Why is a member of Imp here? Charlie asked defensively. I'm not a part of Imp. Mum struck a deal with someone to let me stay with Dad. Mina explained much to the injured teen's confusion. Michael. She started. Shush, 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 Charlie hissed as she covered the pink-skinned girl's mouth. Ixnay on that, okay? Mina rolled her eyes but nodded reluctantly. Another one, Cementos groaned as he pinched the bridge of his rather flat nose. Is this place a crazy magnet? Another? Mina asked as she practically teleported to Cementos with how fast she moved. Charlie was only a split second behind her. A girl in Arena B being treated by medical bots is scanning similarly to you and your friends miss. You know I never did get your last name. Cementos broke his sentence off with his stray thought. Oh, it's Magni. Charlie waved it off. Behind them, Fumikage made his way over. Greetings, O oh Dark Princess. The bird-headed teen nodded with respect. Hi again, your parents doing good? Charlie asked with a grin. Father didn't listen and mum insists I need to listen to more hip-hop. He shuddered in horror at the mere notion of the music. You know each other? Mina asked with a raised eyebrow. Trust me, the circumstances were odd to say the least. Charlie gave a small grin. Fumikage buried his beak into his hands in embarrassment, while Dark Shadow gave a small chuckle. Mina grinned. Oh, she just had to hear this. Aizawa growled lowly to himself as he slammed his head once more against a random wall in Recover Girl's medical ward. He kept repeating the same mantra to himself. There can't be more demons. 
Across from him, sitting at her desk, recovery girl rolled her eyes as she filled out the basic forms Vaggie had provided to the elderly nurse. All up it was a basic hotel resident form for Happy Hotel, citizenship papers for Hell, which Vaggie was helping her with, and a medical report chart which the moth demon left for the nurse. Izuku, meanwhile, was still out at the arena, digging his former friend out of the rubble. The basic resident form was quite simple. It only required name, age at death, stay in hell, genders, basic description, quirk, demonic abilities, dietary restrictions and allergies, and finally sins. The form ended up filled by the time the other exam areas had been fully cleared and most of the examinees were sent home. Only a few had remained behind. A girl from the support class exam called Mei Hatsum, who had to wait for a pickup truck to arrive to haul her stuff back home, and the local demons in Momo, who were now living on campus for the foreseeable future, with Momo leaving her family properties in the hands of the resident staff for as long as needed. Stop trying to kill yourself. I'm one of only two people who handle paperwork at the hotel, and I am not wanting any more. Vagi warned Aizawa before tossing a pencil at the brooding teacher. Don't get me wrong, but I don't plan on dying soon. Aizawa stated bluntly, Vagi rolled her eyes, but went back to helping recovery girl, and everything was quiet for a few minutes only punctuated by the tired hero's repeated mantra. That's what most people think. A chipper voice stated as Charlie skipped into the room with a burnt and bruised Katsuki Bakugo, who was bound and gagged, who was dragged in by an exhausted-looking Cementos. Charlie, we love you dearly, but don't ever fill out the forms. Izuku groaned as he staggered in behind them a mountain of paperwork taller than he was in his arms, a short red-haired, pale-skinned demon with a single yellow eye and a large, fanged grin skipped in next to him, a box of paper in her arms. Hey, boss, she chirped, shoving the box on the desk in front of Vaggy and Recovery Girl. Found these in the drawers for housekeeping instead of admin. Hey, Nifty. Why are you here instead of keeping Baxter out of trouble? Vaggy deadpanned at the cheerful demon. Oh, I just asked Baxter to use the teleporter. Nifty shrugged before skipping over to the spare coats recovery girl kept on the wall and put one on. Oh, neat, I'm a doctor. Paging Dr. Nifty, the patient needs their eyeballs replaced. She giggled loudly. Two things. Charlie stated, one, how are things at the hotel? Two, you didn't teleport bread, did you? Well, yeah, it's all we had to test the device before I could go through that didn't involve losing something important. Nifty replied as Recovery Girl snatched the coat back from the demon and tossed it in a laundry basket near her desk. I'll go deal with it. Izuku sighed as he dumped the paper on Charlie and walked back out the door. Explain, now, Aizawa ordered. Baxter's teleporters often turn bread into full-blown food demons. Vaggy supplied as she helped Charlie with the papers just before she lost her balance, sending it everywhere. Joder, solo porque. Language, recovery girl snapped, whacking Vaggy across the arm with her cane. Who knew she could speak Spanish? Nifty hummed to herself before jumping onto the bed next to the vine-haired demoness. Oh, hey, I know her. You do? Charlie asked. Yeah, Alistair bought her into his spare room in the hotel. Nifty replied honestly as she began to kick her legs back and forth. Alistair, Charlie screamed, her horns, claws, and blood-red eyes were visible for a few moments, making Aizawa gulp nervously and recovery girl nod in understanding, having on more than one occasion wished she could do similar when dealing with a certain buffoon. 
The room got darker as radio static filled the air. Reality itself seemed to glitch like a television with really bad reception as the buzzing grew louder and Vaggie pulled out her spear defensively and Cementos dropped into a fighting stance before with a loud fuzzy buzz. A black pointed shoe attached to red pin stipe pants stepped out of the darkness, a cane topped with an old style microphone not used since before the dawn of quirks appeared next before the figure fully stepped out. Standing there in all his smug glory was Alistair, the radio demon and one of the most feared beings in all of hell in his signature red pin striped suit. His crimson hair spiked up as always and his dark pink monocle was as always balanced neatly on his cheek. You called your majesty, the demon grinned widely. His yellow eyes scanned the room with disinterest until they fell upon the unconscious vine-haired demon. Ah, that is where she went to. Alistair, what did you do? Charlie asked as Nifty shot under the bed to hide, taking a few loose papers from the floor with her. Oh, simply put, this little sinner was preaching falsely when she was ripped in twain by one of the upcoming attractions and devoured. I merely found her first and decided to help. The radio demon grinned with a bow. His cane stretched out behind him with his other arm across his chest. Buck Hugo merely growled through his gag like an enraged chihuahua, going unnoticed by many. Cementos shushed him while keeping his eyes on Alistair. And why? Vaggy asked while glaring daggers, knowing full well how the demon operated. The same reason as any other person does anything. Alistair grinned in a wide and unsettling manner his head tilting to the right as he leaned forward. Pure, unadulterated, boredom. Should have seen that answer coming. Vaggy deadpanned. If teleportation is common, why did she take the unstable teleporter? Aizawa asked as he glared flatly at Nifty. Oh, she just wanted the excuse. Alistair waved it off with a more normal grin. Anyway, now I know she is in good hands, I will be off. I have a radio show to get to, Toodles. With a burst of static, he was gone. The room was silent for a few moments before the doors were once more opened, and an exhausted Izuku stumbled back and now covered in a greenish-brown dough. Bread monster is dead. Hello, green bean, Alistair shouted as he appeared right behind Izuku. The green-haired demon screamed in fear. His hair caught ablaze and flared several feet in height as he went rigid and fell over onto his side. Such a joker, anyway, have fun. With a wink, the demon once more vanished. Fucking hell, tell me he isn't going to do that often. Recovery girl panted slightly while clutching at her chest. Unfortunately, we can't promise that. Charlie admitted as Nifty grabbed a fire extinguisher from the wall and began to spray Izuku before he could accidentally burn down the room. Further down the hall, another scream followed by Alistair's cackle reached their ears. Sorry. Didn't he say he has a show? Aizawa asked. Not for another few minutes, sadly. Vaggy sighed as she checked the clock hanging from the wall above Recovery Girl's desk. You're all problem children, Aizawa declared bluntly as Nifty grabbed a now foam-covered Izuku and literally tossed the teen onto the bed next to the vine-haired demon. What happened next shocked everyone as her vines shot out and wrapped around the catatonic teen and pulled him close. Once he was within arm's reach, she wrapped him in her arms and legs while the teen turned bright red in shock and embarrassment, his hair thankfully not igniting thanks to the foam. Izusama, the girl muttered softly but still loud enough to be heard in the quiet room. Even Katasuki was quiet, although it was more probably in shock of seeing his should-be-dead victim clearly, since before the teen had kept behind and well away from the explosive blonde. I hope she stops that soon. Vaggy muttered darkly as he grip tightened on her spear, while Charlie's usual smile grew strained. Teenagers, recovery girl huffed. I'm demanding a raise. Aizawa deadpanned as he turned and left the room, 
headed straight for Nezu's office and officially done with this shit. Elsewhere, Azazel smiled as she sat in the local church. There was no service or sermon, just quiet as the priest went about his normal duties. A man with a white shirt with a gold tie sat down beside her with a soft smile. Hello. He greeted them quietly without looking. Hello to you, two daughter. The man smiled softly, chuckling quietly when Azazel whipped around, eyes wide at him. Father, you shrunk. Azazel uttered bluntly, too in shock to do anything. No, honey, you've just grown. The man replied with a soft smile. You've been behaving, haven't you? Of course, father, but where have you been? Azazel nodded softly as the priest made his way down the aisles, a broom in hand. Ah, hello, you too. Do you require any help? The priest asked with a calm smile. His quirk simply gave him a pair of extra arms, and as such his suit had been adapted for that fact. No, we're all right. The man replied with a soft smile and shake of his head. You remind me of someone. The priest hummed softly. Oh, the man smiled softly with closed eyes. Yes, you rather do look like Morgan Freeman. The priest stated. I do get that a lot. The man admitted. Sorry for disturbing, but may I ask how long you will be? The priest asked. I have to clean the aisles, and I don't wish to inconvenience you two by blocking your path. Ah, uh, I see. Come along. I saw a nice ice cream parlor down the street. The man smiled as he took Azazel's hand. My treat. You still like waffles, right? As did you say to Izuku? Who gives a shit about that quirkless Deku? Katsuki snapped back. A flash of red flames filled the center of the room making everyone jump in fright before the flames died down, revealing a familiar imp holding a mug standing there accompanied by a werewolf in goth clothing with a pentagram-shaped bra visible through the boob window of her SHRT, who merely sighed as they held onto a clipboard while typing on a red phone. Hello again, shit stain. Blitzo grinned cheerfully at Katsuki before he looked around the room while sipping at a hot chocolate in a unicorn mug his eyes landing on Mitsuki where he did a spit take spraying one officer with the drink. Mitsuki Eyama. Bakugo now, actually. The woman blinked. Aren't you that guy who always used to go to the charity shoots to help with the horses? Uh, well, yeah, I think horses are just the best. The imp gave a shy smile with his head bowed slightly. Way to go, dad. How did you manage to sneak that into a contract? The werewolf asked with a raised eyebrow and sarcastic drawl, knowing full well nine times out of ten he tried to sneak it into a contract. Actually, it was fairly simple. It was the payment for killing some old gangster in charge of the seven prefects of death a few decades back. Blitzo admitted proudly. Some germaphobe Kai something or other didn't want to get his hands dirty, literally. You do realize we are on duty, right? One officer asked. Statue of Limitations. Blitzo grinned smugly. Translation, the idiot forgot you were there. The werewolf stated as she handed the clipboard to Mitsuki. Read it through then sign it please, just states that your son is under supervisor, as per the non-fatal clause in a hit put on him otherwise I've got a knife I can ram through his chest. Shut up you shitty furry, Katsuki snapped. What? The werewolf growled. Hey, Blitzo snapped. Nobody talks to my baby girl Luna like that. Shut up, the scarf wearing man snapped his eyes going red as his hair stood up on end, and his scarf waved about like an angry cobra. Everybody calm down. Sure thing, pencil head. Blitzo huffed. It's erase your head. The hero sighed as he pinched the bridge of his nose. Now get to the point. I'm just here to collect Midoriya's stuff, seeing as this place isn't going to be suitable for him to stay at. Can I see him? 
I know my son is an ass and Izuku is probably under watch, but he is still my nephew. Mitsuki pleaded to the hero. Uh, is this a bad time? Standing up the top of the stairs in nothing but a towel was Masaru Bakugo, who looked shocked as anything at everyone in the room. Hey, isn't that the guy with the horse obsession? Elsewhere, a groan of cement filled a small room as a bright light shone under the doors and through the cracks in the walls and floor. Everything shook like a tremor as a scared little girl was huddled in the corner on a tattered old mattress, a golden cube clutched in her hands bloodied. A gas mask wearing man in white with gloves on his hands and purple feathers around his neck laid twitching on the floor in a puddle of his own flood. A gash was at the base of his neck which was bleeding profusely. With a slam the door was flung open revealing a short black clad figure their features indistinguishable due to the bright light at their back shrouding their front in shadows. They looked around briefly, only turning their head before they spoke in a female voice. You have called and I have answered. There was no warning before a chain shot out of the light, a rusted butcher's hook on the end dug into the man's skin making him scream out in pain. Several more shot out of various locations around the room, seemingly coming from the shadows themselves as the man was hoised into a perversion of Jesus on the cross. This is no sight for a child, look away. The figure advised only for the girl to shake her head. No, do you wish to see what becomes of him? The girl gave a shy nod as she clutched tighter at the cube. The figure merely waved a hand, and with an agonized scream of pain, ripping of flesh and popping of bones, the man was rendered apart with a spray of blood covering everything in the room in a layer of red, including the girl. Come, you can't be left here. The figure beckoned the small girl. Hesitantly, she stumbled closer until she was mere feet from the figure, now able to see the soft smile from pink lips and pale skin framed by green hair. With a soft and caring smile, the woman brushed some blood-soaked hair away from her face, revealing a small budding horn. Come along now. She smiled as she led the girl into the bright light. W, who are you? The small girl stuttered slightly. The woman paused briefly before she blinked and looked down at the small girl. You may call me your... Mitsuki growled with gritted teeth as she tried to wrangle her pain and the ass son into a headlock to brush his hair. Stay fucking still, brat. Bite me, bitch. Katsuki snarled as he tried in vain to get away from his mother. The sound of thudding, hissing and a male yelping in pain was heard from a different room in the house, but was ignored until the door that lead to the bathroom was slammed open and a disgruntled Masara stumbled out covered in scratches. A small old tabby cat who was missing an eye and had two fangs poking from bellow, its upper lip saunter out smugly. Cats had its tablet. The man grumbled in annoyance. The cat had originally belonged to his brother Hisashi Midoriya before the man left his wife and son, and after Inko's death Mitsuki decided to take in the half-blind feline. Matters were only made worse by the fact the animal had a quirk that allowed the furball to eat anything it wanted, and as much as it wanted. With a hacking cough, the cat spat up a small red oval-shaped tablet into the rug. It could also vomit up anything it had eaten on command as well. Fucking cat. Masara muttered in annoyance at the smug feline. Hopefully Izuku is able to take the furball back. Way shut up. Goose is fucking awesome, Katsuki declared fiercely. The explosive blonde had taken a liking to the fur ball, who seemed to not only understand what they were saying but purred with smug satisfaction whenever it annoyed Masara. It also helped the fur ball used to cough up things such as loose change or small toys for them when him and Izuku were in preschool.
Mitsuki, sweetie, it's only 7.30. Marissa stated as he shuffled off to look for band-aids for his scratches and some wipes and paper towels to deal with what was left of Goose's tablet. So, Mitsuki grunted as she tried to get her son's hair somewhat presentable. We aren't leaving until 10 a.m. He replied making Katsuki freeze in shock and realization. You telling me she is fucking with my hair when we aren't leaving for another two and a half fucking hour. Katsuki screamed in fury as he tried to struggle more. You bitch. As another fight broke out, they failed to hear the mail slot open as a letter drifted down to the mat below the door. The envelope was a plain white with three golden diamonds printed on the front, giving the illusion of a cube. Just below it was a simple sentence that without the correct context was a harmless business slogan that read, We have such sights to show you. Goose glared, hissing softly at the letter and backed off, never breaking eye contact with it the entire time. Elsewhere, Ibarra yawned tiredly as she blinked blearily at the increasingly familiar ceiling above her. What was new, however, was the sensation of being wrapped around someone, her vine hair holding them and two others tightly against her chest. Looking down, she quickly snapped from half asleep to fully awake and blushing as she caught sight of the green-haired boy who saved her yesterday while the blonde-haired girl with rosy pink cheeks in a set of red pajamas with an apple pattern on them and a gray-skinned girl with silver hair in a simple nightgown each held down one of his arms, essentially pinning him to the bed more so than her vines were currently doing. Izusama, she uttered while blushing, I'll repay your kindness by our lord's gray og. She shrieked in pain as she clutched at her head in pain, faintly aware of something warm running from her nose. Her scream seemed to be the thing that woke the others up all at once. Izuku from the shock instantly had his skull engulfed in flames as his flesh burnt off rapidly bringing the stench of charred flesh that only served to make Ibarra hungry while Vaggie and Charlie sprang up with weapons drawn as their eyes quickly landed on her. Why the fuck are you screaming at this hour? Vaggie groaned. I don't know what happened. Ibarra admitted as one of her vines wiped the blood from her upper lip and nose before she grabbed onto the appendage and started sucking on the end. Bad thought, Izuku squeaked as he turned around. The small fire that was present flared into a raging inferno as he did so. Vaggie's eye went wide as she blushed and Charlie just giggled like a perv. Too early for this shit. Vaggie muttered to herself as she looked anywhere but the oblivious Ibarra. I'm going to grab coffee, want anything. Juice, please, Izuku squeaked. A drink as dark as my soul, Charlie declared dramatically with a stern expression, gaining Ibarra's attention who blushed upon realizing what she was doing and promptly stopped. So, hot chocolate, 70% milk. Three scoops of sugar and marshmallows, Vaggie asked with a grin. Yes, please, Charlie beamed cheerfully with a skip in her step as she headed for the bathroom. Anything for you, Vaggie asked Ibarra. Just some bread and water, please, raw meat too if they have it. The vine-haired girl requested politely with a bow. I think the D detective will be over shortly to discuss arrangements for, well, your B body. Izuku stammered awkwardly. Mother will be insufferable. Ibarra sighed in resignation. Father would probably have a fit too. Izuku didn't know what exactly to say in the situation, but he certainly knew the feeling given that it was his life up until he took that piece of terrible advice. Is that much caffeine truly needed? Ibarra asked curiously as she sipped at her water. Her vines draped over the back of the chair seemed to enjoy soaking up the sunlight from the window behind her. Trust me, I had trouble getting to sleep last night without the constant background noise of hell outside the window. It was weird as fuck. Vaggy shrugged. Language. Izuku and Ibarra chided the moth demon. So, I know my parents would probably be paying for me, but what about you three? 
Ibarra asked, making Izuku and Vagi freeze in shock. I'm pretty sure the bank has confiscated my account after I died. Izuku seemed to pale even more if such a thing was possible given his naturally pale complexion. Don't worry, I had it sorted. Charlie smiled as she pulled the two in for a hug. I had it paid for in full the other day. Japan accepts souls, Izuku asked in confusion, contrary to belief. Hell didn't deal with mortal souls, rather the currency was called souls and a misunderstanding on the part of humans lead to them calling the human spirit a soul. Needless to say, it had resulted in several awkward moments and even a war in the past. Of course not, I exchanged it at a bank. They all have ties in hell since dad seemed to like helping them with the startup funds. Charlie shrugged it off with a smile before letting go of Izuku to take a sip of her hot chocolate before pulling the green-haired Koenobite back into the hug. I always knew the banks were run by sinners. I borrowed deadpan with a sigh. Great, now I'm a hypocrite. Izusama, do you still love me even if I'm a hypocrite sinner? Can we focus on fixing whatever Alistair did to her first? Vaggie asked with a sigh before downing her second coffee in one go, same as the first. Well, inside of every demon is a rainbow. Charlie was quickly silenced by a kiss from Vaggie. The blonde blushed, then grinned lazily with a content sigh. Hee hee wow. Is this normal? Ibarra asked as she watched the scene before her with a thoughtful look her vines raising up behind her like a snake rising from a basket. Yeah, pretty much, Izuku admitted bashfully. Both demons had used impromptu make-out sessions to stop one thing or another, mostly Charlie's singing or Vaggy trying to hurt and or kill Angel Dust or Alistair. I see. Ibarra hummed to herself before her vines wrapped around Izuku, and she pulled him in for a kiss causing his skull to combust into a raging inferno of green fire. Despite the heat and slight burns, Ibarra kept her lips pressed against his lips, but then his teeth as they burnt away. She hummed contently as a blush blossomed across her pale cheeks. Hands off our boyfriend, Vaggy and Charlie screamed as they dove across the table both in their demonic forms and tacked the vine demon to the floor. My Izu-sama, Ibarra snapped possessively as he vines wrapped the two demons before they could think rationally and pull their weapons on her. Please don't hurt them, Ibarra Khan. Izuku asked with a raspy voice, unable to move from the neck down due to the vines which constricted him from the shoulders down. Why you called me Khan? Izusama called me Kun. Ibarra squealed happily as she blushed a bite red. I, if Izusama wishes it, I too shall join this harem. I think she completely misunderstood the situation. Vaggy deadpan before being silenced by a rather heated kiss from the vine demon. Bad thought. Izuku squeaked as he tried to look away only for the vines holding him to constantly adjust to have him looking at the scene before him. Me next, Charlie shouted upon seeing the satisfied grin her girlfriend was sporting. Ibarra was more than happy to oblige the princess of her request. Wow okay, you are definitely allowed to date us. I'm pretty sure this is a sin. Izuku admitted he would have certainly been blushing by now if he had any skin on his skull besides his vocal cords. How he could see he had no clue and chalked it down to magic. I mean maybe but they let Hitler into heaven for killing Hitler. Dad is still pissed about it. Charlie admitted with a faint blush and panting. Wait, how does that work? Ibarra asked in confusion as her vines finally withdrew. I have zero clue who decided it, but basically whoever killed Hitler was guaranteed a spot in heaven. Vaggy explained. Since that Hijo deputa Nazi offed himself, he got out of his dues. Why didn't they just kick him out? Izuku asked with a strained tone. The Second World War may have been centuries ago, 
but that evil little man had contributed to the deadliest war in history and the deaths of millions of people. No clue, honestly. Charlie shrugged. Although given the amount of people in hell with an axe to grind with him and his regime, you can bet the second they do kick him out, he won't last a minute. Great, now my breakfast is ruined. Ibarra pouted as she looked at her mushed bread on the table. At least being in Izu Sama's harem is worth it. I don't have a harem, Izuku protested. I don't know, I think Momo looks pretty hot. Charlie waggled her eyebrows with a teasing grin. What do you think room for two more in one day? Damn it, Charlie, did you drink Baxter's energy drinks again? Vaggy groaned with a face palm. I hope we aren't interrupting anything. Nezu laughed from his spot atop the secretary's shoulder. The skeletal blonde man looked shocked and embarrassed. Aizawa, who as usual looked half asleep, and the officer with them just looked fed up with everything. We just need a signature, and we can hand over your corpse. The man sighed in agitation as he passed Ibarra a standardized form. Sign on the lines and initials where the X's are. How often does this happen that it's standardized? Vagi asked as she took the forms from Ibarra and began to look them over for any hidden legal trappings and loopholes. Bureaucrats are terrifying. The skeletal man sweat dropped. Aizawa deadpanned. More often than not it's Ecoplasm or one of his relatives that has to deal with that shit. Ah uh, yes, before I forget the exam results will be handed out in two weeks time once everything has been graded. Until then, suffer ha 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 ha. Nezu cackled like a maniac. Again Rodent's special place in hell. Vaggy growled with a twitching eye as she looked up from the contract. Already having found several poorly hidden by hell's standards legal trappings and loopholes that were relatively easy to get around as long as Ibarra wasn't planning on collecting life insurance or selling off the meat from her former body as dog food. Not food, just dog food, nothing about any other animal or even person than she was in the clear. They also couldn't claim the body was the Dalai Lama for some reason, unless they had the blessing of the previous Dalai Lama. Uh, am I all good? Ibarra asked as she read over Vaggy's shoulder. You're good so long as you don't collect the insurance, use your body as dog food or claim. It is the Dalai Lama without their consent. Vaggy shrugged as she handed the forms to the vine demon who began to fill out the forms. Right, while that is happening, who wants some tea? Nezu asked with a large grin. I have gold tips I have been saving for a while now that I was holding on to for a special occasion. Speaking of special occasions, when am I getting my raise? Aizawa asked the principal. When you stop expelling the entire class. Nezu cackled maniacally. Fucking rat. Aizawa grunted in annoyance. Can I at least expel the blonde bastard? Nope, the HSC will be on both our asses if that happens. Nezu shrugged. You've got to be shitting me. Aizawa groaned. Can't the pencil pushers just fuck off? Done. Ibarra stated as she handed the signed form back to the officer. Here you go. He deadpanned as he handed her a small black case and left with the forms. Ibarra immediately opened the case and raised an eyebrow at her decapitated head. The tooth marks across the severed neck and lower jaw certainly revealed how she died too. Ha, I, uh, nope, just nope. With that, the vine demon slammed the case shut again and planted it firmly on the table. My parents can deal with that, not me. Just no. Mitsuki Bakugo hummed to herself as she fixed up her hair with one hand, while her husband held a small mirror for her. Her other hand was currently holding onto her son's shirt to prevent him storming off. The gate to Yua was certainly much bigger than the TV made it out to be for sure. The midday sun bearing down on them probably didn't help much either. Done. 
She nodded to herself as she took the mirror from her husband and put it inside her handbag and then hit the buzzer next to the gate. Being early meant that they hadn't been expected for a half hour or more later, but as luck would have it Aizawa was close enough that Nedzu Wad able to rope the tired hero into answering the gate once the principal saw who it was through the cameras. It was with a flat glare that Aizawa gave a simple warning to the small family. Don't cause problems or I'm kicking you all out. That goes doubly for you living hand grenade. Fucking bite me, Katsuki snarled in anger, only for Mitsuki to cuff him around the back of his head. Fuck off, old hag. You sir must have the patience of a saint. Aizawa sighed as he gave a flat look towards Masura, who was trying to mitigate the situation. You don't know the half of it. The brown-haired man sighed as he lead his bickering son and wife into the school, after Aizawa, who was somehow keeping walking pace while crawling in a sleeping bag. Eventually, they had arrived at a massive H-shaped building covered in windows with several balconies along the upper levels from the third floor up. Entering the building itself, Marsura was rather impressed with the design and made a few mental notes about looking into the designer for the next fashion shoot he and Mitsuki would be doing. It was only a simple lobby, but the aesthetics was pleasing to look at. Entering an elevator at the back of the room, Eraser Head in one swift motion went from laying down to standing up before he pressed the level 3 button and the doors closed. Heads up! There may be a dismembered head laying around somewhere, Aizawa stated bluntly. Pardon, Mitsuki gasped in shock. The problem child isn't the only one who is unread here. Aizawa sighed, how he hated Ken right now. Bastard had bribed Nedzu with cheese, tea and wine to keep most of the demons out of his classroom, only taking the former nun as Nedzu didn't want things to be too easy on the vampire-themed hero. As the doors opened, they were treated to the sight of what could only be described as a flaming man made of muscle fibers being wailed on by a teen with a burning skull for a head, a pale woman covered in razor-sharp vines, a giant female anthropomorphic mother with a red spear, and a white-skinned stereotypical demon with an apple-themed trident in a dress shirt. What the actual fuck, Katsuki deadpanned. He was not in the mood for weird shit. Oh, hi, Kachin. Izuku gulped nervously before awkwardly kicking the burnt being. Problem child, what is that? Aizawa deadpanned. I'm sorry, sir. Ibrara uttered as she warily kicked the burning demon. I tried to make lunch, but it summoned this instead. Let's talk more banishing legion. Vaggy snarled as she tried repeatedly to skewer the demon under them. Her spear had barely made a scratch on the multi-demon due to the heat shield it was producing with its body. Suffer not the brats. Aizawa sighed in annoyance as Bakugo jumped into the fight, each explosion actually harming Legion more than the last. At least they're not fighting each other. Masura stated with a raised eyebrow, pointedly ignoring Mitsuki joining in on the fight. Her own quirk had the nice side effect of providing a buffer layer against the fire. I better get the fucking raise. Aizawa growled, knowing full well he quirk wouldn't work on the demons, and he couldn't use it on Mitsuki or Katsuki without potentially getting them killed. Three weeks later, Tokyo. A blonde girl with vampire-like fangs grinned to herself as she licked the blood off her blades with a blush. She had gotten into some rich art snob's house and found him already dead ripped to shreds by hooks of all things, leaving a delightfully bloody mess. She had of course stabbed him a few dozen times to make sure he was truly dead, but she wasn't one to complain over free blood and stabbings. She looked over to the middle of the bigger blood puddle, such a waste of blood, and saw in the middle of it all was a small gold dagger engraved with lots of different symbols. With a tide of her head, she picked it up and gave it a few practice swings. Him, this isn't that good, not very swishy, must also be good for stabbing. 
She grinned widely as she plunged the blade into the corpse of the man, a few times experimentally. A arch of energy shot across the blade, leaving a burning sensation in her palm as the handle clicked open and turned slowly, a melodic tune playing in the air. Oh my gosh, she squealed in joy. It's a stabby that plays music. Hey, you found the knife mummy gave me. A soft voice interrupted her fun. Turning her head, she saw a small albino girl with blood-red eyes in a simple white dress stained with blood looking at her with excitement. Mummy said I can be friends with anyone who can make it play music. Will you be my friend? Sure, I'm Toga. The blonde grinned widely as she licked some blood from the blade. What little hadn't been absorbed by it at any rate, that is. What's your name, cutie? I'm Eri. The small girl grinned. Do you like blood like my mummy does? Blood is awesome. Toga grinned back. Eri nodded seriously with a smile. I've got a game I want to show you if I tell you my name. You'll have to play, too I've been here for ages. Biding my time waiting and primed until I could find you, Eri sang as she skipped over, uncaring of the puddle of blood she walked through. Her time with Overhaul had long since desensitized her to such things. Just give us a shake and we can be friends I'll be here for you until the world ends enjoy all the joys. We will supply you only live once and you'll be mine. Eri continued to sing as she grasped Toga's hand which held the gold knife as the room began to creak and shudder. A bright light seeped under the doors and through the cracks in the walls. The day you die, I'll have my playmate your eternal soul's arraignment. Did you divine our fun arrangement? You will love the entertainment. Eri gushed as she spun around with Toga, bloody footprints trailing in their wake as the vampire teen laughed joyfully. This was the most fun she had in years. The fun desires you've been serving you can bet that you're deserving no regret for who you're hurting why it's almost like you're laughing. Eri continued as Toga slipped and fell yet continued to laugh, even though she had sliced open her hand on the knife, which was now sparking violently. Come into my world, take a look at me, I am the sunshine on the dark side of the moon. I'm your first, last resort so call me when you need a helping hand play your cards right. And I'll see you soon, Eri grinned widely as the room around them fell apart, revealing them to be on a platform near the middle of a sprawling maze that went on far beyond the visible horizon. A giant monolith spun slowly in the middle of it all. Sorry, I don't mean to alarm you if you ask to stay. I would be charmed to you all have such cozy little lives. How do you survive like that? I wish I knew. Eri shrugged cutely as Toga's eyes went wide with what she was seeing. Even her fractured mind realized something was horribly wrong. But you've got a lovely little secret you're tired of feeling awful small, so you give us a call to make a deal because you're looking for the sights you want to see them, earthly delights you feel you need them, your appetites I'll help you feed them, I'll be your sweet Cenobite demon. A new figure sung as they approached from the light emitted by the central monolith. A short female figure with pale bluish-white skin, green hair and black soulless eyes. And once your boredom has abated, don't forget your friend who waited watched as you had your fun, and did I mention that you're cursed? The woman sung as she lifted the now terrified toga up by her jaw. Her fingers dug into the girl's skin drawing blood as they slid around under the surface. Come into my world, take a look at me, I am the nutmare on the dark side of the moon, I'm your first, last resort so call me when you need a helping hand, play your cards wrong, and I'll see you soon, the woman sung as she delicately wiped some bloody hair away from Toga's face, leaving a streak of blood as Iri dragged a small round table with snacks over. You lay your chips out on the table now when you gamble snacks. The house will always win. I'm double dealing in the apples and I'm here to catch my payout. I hope it was worth the life of fun. Eri sang proudly as she waved around an apple as if it was the best thing in the world, not even noticing or realizing what was happening to Toga as a bad thing, especially compared to the horror she had endured. 
Welcome to my world. Take a look around inside your fantasies, deep beyond the little box. You made a wrong turn at the crossroads, now you're at the final episode, Eternity with me in hell. The woman sung as she pulled her bloodied hand out of Toga's skin, leaving behind a trickle of blood amidst a red smear. The blonde was left shuddering and poking at the wounds with a curious expression. All the while her dagger started to collapse in on itself, gears churned and clicked as it unfolded and folded in on itself multiple times as it did so, its melody becoming more complex and beautiful as the seconds ticked by. Pleasure to play, how I will enjoy you let's just say when I play, I don't lose collect on the debts that you owed, it was such a laugh, I really am amused. The woman grinned as the light of the monolith bathed them in a bright light. Toga screamed in pain as she dropped to her knees, clawing at her arm as the dagger unfolded a blade right into her arm between her carpal bones. Have a fun thought, I'm right beside you a casual giggle, just to guide you look over your shoulder and I'm gone remember this song and I bid you good day. The woman and Eri sung together as Toga dropped to her side tears streaming down her face as her heart felt like it was held in an icy vice. Mummy, is she going to be my new sister? Yuri asked curiously as she sat down with her apple to eat. The song had been her way of getting between her home and other people's homes similarly to the cubes were used. No, there is something more special in mind for her sweetie. The woman explained gently. She is a bit sick and we're going to make her better. Like a doctor, Iri asked nervously. Don't worry, little one. Nobody is going to hurt you unless you ask. The woman hushed Iri as she cuddled the smaller girl against her chest. Neither really cared much that there was now blood on both of them. For them, this was an everyday occurrence. Now, let's get her all better for your brother. When will I meet him? Eri asked curiously as she pulled back. Soon, sweetie, soon, and then we can be one big happy family. The woman grinned cheerfully before with another pass of light from the monolith. The three of them vanished without a trace. Only smears of blood on dusty stone marked their visit. All too soon school had started for the year. With the first day of class came a rush of new faces to the campus, with the only year-round students being a trio of students, now starting their third year and a lanky student with a squirrel tail in the business course second year. The morning started off as normal for the group. Vaggy and Izuku grabbed everyone breakfast, Ibarra was soaking in the morning sunlight, while nibbling on a loaf of bread and Charlie was humming to herself as she enjoyed a cup of hot chocolate. So, which teacher do you think you'll have? Izuku asked as he enjoyed a piece of toast smothered in butter and topped with bacon and egg. I think it's either present Mike or midnight for me. Vaggy shrugged as she blew on a cup of coffee. Well, they stuck us in one a while Ibarra is in 1B, so one of us is getting Mr. Grumpy Grumps. Charlie hummed happily. Not even the prospect of a grumpy Aizawa dampened her mood. As long as you're not in the same class as Katsuki, I'm good, Izusama. Ibarra admitted with a soft frown. The girl really hated the blonde bomber after he had proceeded to insult everyone in the room with less than 20 words, and then started to try and threaten her Izusama. This all happened while they were trying to banish Legion too. She was just glad the others didn't end up meeting her parents when she left for that after the incident, or who knows how they would have reacted. Was nice of the principal to let us share a room though. Charlie smiled happily to herself while Izuku blushed in embarrassment from the mention of it. After finding out about the arrangements Katsuki had thrown a fit while his aunt went into matchmaker mode. He was positive there had to be a succubus somewhere within her family line. It was the only thing that made any sense. Well, it could be worse. Vaggy shrugged as she chugged the coffee in one go. At least the rat didn't sell us out to the media yet. I can see the headlines now. Charlie grinned widely as she stood up. 
one foot resting on the chair as she waved her left hand in the air. Not all demons bad. Or demons infiltrate hero school for evil plan. Izuku replied with a sigh, more than fed up with the media in both hell and earth. If it wasn't the vultures who pester every hero on earth, it was Killjoy and Tom down in hell trying to ruin Charlie's dream while ridiculing him and the other hotel staff. PSH, I'm sure it won't happen like that. Charlie waved it off. Did we learn nothing from Killjoy? Faggy sighed as she put her mug in the sink and picked up a simple satchel bag from the bench. I'm off, got to get to 1E before the bell rings, and it's the other side of the school. Adios, Miss Amores. See ya, after the opening ceremony, Charlie called back excitedly before taking a long gulp of hot chocolate. We should be off too. Izuku sighed as he stood up, cracking his fingers as he did so. You're going to get arthritis. Ibarra stated absently as her vines shot across the room to grab her bag. That's a myth. Izuku retorted as Charlie grabbed her bag and walked into the elevator with them, still drinking her hot chocolate. After a quick decent, they came into the main lobby to find Aizawa asleep in his bag with a Do Not Disturb sign hung around him. They simply ignored it, long since used to the man's sleeping habits. Even amongst other hero schools, Aizawa was well known to be able to sleep just about anywhere as long as he had his sleeping bag. How isn't that empty yet? Izuku asked curiously as Ibarra split off from them, heading towards campus east instead of north like they were. Bottomless cup. Charlie shrugged. What? That makes no sense, it would just continue to fall after you put the drink in if it was bottomless, or you'd need an increasingly longer straw to reach it. Izuku replied in confusion. Ayohano. Charlie managed around another mouthful. I swear you're lucky you're somehow immune to cavities, Charlie. Izuku sighed as they found the sign for Class 1A. This is it, I juice. I'm so excited. Charlie practically squealed as she pushed open the door, revealing only a few desks were filled. Momo was sitting around back to the side and writing something in her notebook. The hazard tape wrapped briefcase was on the desk next to her. Tokoyami and his sister were located in the back corner of the room, with the two of them reading from an occult book. Izuku blushed bright red while Charlie giggled after all the symbol on the front was for a dating service in hell. A blue-haired teen with glasses was near the front sitting as still as a statue as he went over the timetable sheet he had in front of him. Also in the back row was a set of floating clothes that was talking animatedly with the pink-skinned demon called Mina that Charlie had told him about. The rest neither he or Charlie had met before. A ginger-haired girl whose hair was done in a similar ponytail to Momo's, a girl with purple hair and audio jacks for earlobes, a rock-headed teen who was sitting quietly to the side, a teen with six webbed arms and a scarf over their mouth, a girl with green hair and a frog-like mouth, a purple-haired boy who looked like a mini Aizawa, a muscular teen with massive lips, a girl with a burn scar over half her face and a bob haircut. A teen with half his face also burnt corresponding with his red and white hair color. And a girl with pink dreadlocks who was wearing a pair of overalls instead of uniform who was sitting on a desk and tinkering with something. The final person was a girl whose hair seemed permanently wet and draped over her face. Her skin was a clammy gray color and small scars adorned her fingers. With a shrug, they chose to sit in the back row between Tokoyami and his sister and Momo. So, how are you holding up? Charlie asked Momo softly. The black-haired teen had been living off campus while her estate and parents' funerals were sorted. I... I've been better. Momo sighed. I still want to destroy this blasted thing before anyone else is hurt by it. Maybe we could try acid. Charlie suggested. Momo shook her head. I dunked it in perenna solution and even sulfuric acid. 
All it did was remove any dirt and blood still within the joints. Maybe we can melt it, Izuku offered but blushed when Momo deadpanned. I put this in a crucible hot enough to melt tungsten and all it accomplished was singeing it. The heiress revealed bluntly, maybe we should just dump it at the bottom of the ocean. Charlie suggested, on the list of things to try next it goes. Momo hummed as she wrote it down. So how have you been? Mina asked as she turned around in her chair with a smirk to face the back row. Any juicy details? Are we sure Angel Dust didn't lie about not having relatives? Izuku muttered to Charlie. She is giving off serious Angel Dust vibes. It's her mother who is from back home, not her father. Charlie replied, deliberately avoiding use of the words Hell or Pentagram City. Are we sure Angel is a guy? Izuku replied. Charlie opened her mouth, finger raised to reply before she frowned with a thoughtful expression. You know, I'm not sure honestly. Let's just label Angel Dust as Angel Dust and call it a day, shall we? Charlie asked with a soft frown. She was certain that it was written on their hotel forms but she couldn't remember what was listed given Angel Dust's atrocious handwriting. With a loud crack, the door was booted open, making everyone asides the pink-haired girl jump in shock at how sudden and loud the sound was. What the fuck you looking at, you shitty extras? Oh, hey, Katsuki. Izuku sighed, slumping slightly at the fact that his childhood tormentor was in the same class as him. Shut it, Deku. The blonde snarled before storming to his desk and putting his feet up. Get your feet of that desk now. The blue-haired teen ordered as he stood up and made robotic chopping motions with his hands. It is highly disrespectful to our upperclassmen, not to mention your atrocious behavior is unbecoming of someone who made it into you, uh. Bite me, Bakugo snapped only to be pelted in the back of his head by a pencil. Shooting up, the blonde snarled as explosions crackled in his hands. Who the actual fuck has a death wish? I still owe you for blowing off half my face. The girl with a bob cut snarled as she gripped at another pencil. At this point, the other students got up, ready to restrain either the explosive blonde or the girl depending on how the situation went. My parents are in debt because of the shit you did. Like I give a shit you bloody extra, Bakugo snarled as he made to dive at the brown haired girl, only to find himself wrapped up in a scarf of all things and unable to use use quirk. Who the actual fuck? Bakugo stepped down. Aizawa growled from his place at the door, his eyes glowing a bright red as his hair floated around his head. Same goes with you bob cut. Hey sensei. The purple-haired started gesturing behind the tired hero. Who's that? Izuku could only facepalm as Aizawa jumped in shock, making him drop Katsuki face first onto the ground. Charlie giggled at the sight. Mina, however, was hyperventilating in fear. Standing behind Aizawa was Azazel who was as usual writing down her notes in her notepad. Why are you here? Aizawa deadpan. Oh, Nezu hired me to help mediate the class, Azazel admitted. Jay, just because I'm more focused on research doesn't mean I can't fight. Whatever. Aizawa groaned as he pinched his nose, tossing several bags onto the desk at the front of the room. Everyone grab a P-uniform and head down to Field Beta after getting changed. If you take longer than six minutes, you're expelled. Without missing a beat, several students rushed for the uniforms, while some like the rock-headed teen, or the teen with six arms, were not moving from their spots. You've wasted ten seconds, get moving. Aizawa snapped, causing the remaining students to grab a uniform and rush for the locker room. Once everyone had left, he leveled a glare at the angel. Why are you really here? I told the truth, I was hired to mediate the class by Nezu. 
Azazel muttered with a blush as she hid behind her notebook. At Aizawa's glare and growl, she gulped. And to keep an eye on any potential or budding romances. Figures. Aizawa snorted dismissively as he climbed into his sleeping bag and made his way towards the field. Don't think I didn't see you following me and Emma's joke on that date. She dragged me on either. Addendum to Aizawa's file. Soon, dear. Azazel muttered quietly. I have good hearing, too. Aizawa called back, making the angel squeak in fright and rush after him. Field Beta. As the class gathered in the designated field, Aizawa could only roll his eyes at how enthusiastic two of the class demons were being. He did make a mental note to avoid putting certain students in groups or against one another. Mainly this was between the Living Hand Grenade, Bob Cut, and Problem Broccoli Demon. Right, everybody listen up. Aizawa called. Bakugo, what's your top score for ball throw? Like 70 meters or some shit. The explosive blonde replied with a scoff as Aizawa tossed him a ball, taking no small pleasure from the fact he nailed the blonde in the face. Stand in the circle, so long as you don't leave it, you can use any means to throw the ball as far as you can. The teacher deadpanned. Bakugo growled but entered the circle before he wound back his arm, and with a cry of die, and a massive explosion, the ball shot forwards. Charlie, Azazel, and Aizawa noticed how Izuku and the bob-haired girl flinched at the explosion, while the girl with ear jacks winced in pain. A beep was heard as Aizawa pulled out a scanner that showed 764 3M as a result. This is what you're training for. The education system is behind in the times and won't allow quirks to flourish. Here we'll change that. Aizawa stated as he showed the class the scanner. Azazel hummed as she marked down the number in her notebook. Wow, we get to use our quirks. This will be fun. Mina exclaimed with a large grin as she punched the air. Fun. Natural disasters, villains, terrorists, having your own home attacked. Does any of that seem fun to you? Aizawa growled. That is the nature of being a hero. For that whoever scores lowest will be expelled. But that's not fair. The floating uniform shouted while jumping up and down. Life's not fair. If you think this will be a handy little 9 to 5 job and hanging out at McCronald's after school with your friends, then you have another thing coming and should just walk out now. Aizawa frowned at the invisible girl. Hey, I'm not gonna give up. Charlie grinned widely. If it means I can help people improve themselves and live a better life, then I won't quit. Heck yeah, the ginger girl shouted with a fist pump. I can't let my dad down, so I won't quit either. Shut up extras, I'm going to be the number one hero, Bakugo shouted back. Like hell you are, the bob cut girl shouted back. I'll be a better hero than you. Bring it. Bakugo shouted and went to jump only to be restrained once more by Aizawa who sighed in agitation. For those who want to know why the blonde hand grenade hasn't been expelled yet, the brat has protection from the HSC, however if he doesn't shape up we will be booting him into general studies. Aizawa threatened. His reply was a feral growl. You bob cut don't have that protection so save it. So. What's your name? Charlie asked with a grin to the bob cut girl. I'm Ochako Yuraka. The girl responded. Nice to meet you, I'm Charlie Magni. This is my boyfriend Izuku. Charlie grinned as she pulled Izuku in for a hug. Charlie. Izuku whined with a blush. Problem child too, don't make him burst into flames again. Aizawa stated bluntly. Next up on the ball toss is Toru Hagakure. The invisible girl walked into the circle and began her turn. Was he joking or is that your quirk? The girl with audio jacks for earlobes asked with a quirked eyebrow. 
I can turn into a flaming skeleton and have pyrokinetic and thermal manipulation abilities. Izuku explained using the cover recovery girl had literally hammered into his skull over the last four weeks along with several insensitives from Vaggy and Charlie in the form of snacks. Ibarra who was barred from the kitchen instead tried offering everything from massages to movie dates to even herself. That last one had almost ended in the dorms burning down. Damn that's cool, all I can do is make my fist big. The ginger girl sighed in resignation. Oh no. Charlie uttered as Izuku began to mutter rapidly to himself before with a burst of flame his skull was exposed as he paced and muttered. Problem child, Aizawa snapped in annoyance as the six-armed student started his throw. Wow, you weren't kidding, Ochako uttered in shock. Izuku sweetie, you're mutting and pacing again. Charlie warned as she nudged his shoulder. He stopped, looked around before Skull palmed with a raspy groan. Sorry. He rasped before his flesh appeared over his skull in a reverse of incinerating flesh. Irk. Yuroka gagged as she covered her mouth, trying not to vomit. Unfortunately, she forgot to lift her pinky and started to float upwards before the green-haired girl shot out her tongue which wrapped Arion the nauseous girl and pulled her back down. If you're quite finished, Todoroki, you're up, Aizawa called. Sorry, Izuku gulped nervously. Ochako opened her mouth to apologize only for Liquid Rainbow to shoot out and onto the ground in front of her. Here, Momo offered as she lifted her shirt enough to expose her midriff and a bucket and towel melted out of her skin which she promptly handed to the vomiting girl as she lowered her shirt. I'd make some nausea pills too, but I'm not allowed to make medication or currency or the HSC will toss me in Tartarus. Illogical idiots. Aizawa muttered in annoyance at the HSC comment moments before a massive glacier sent the ball flying through the air. The device beeped twice. 200-301M. Magni, you're up. Yes, Sensei, Charlie called as she jogged over. Your uniform is stretchable, so use your quirk. Aizawa ordered bluntly. You are sure. Charlie gulped as with a burst of flame she assumed her demonic form. She was three foot taller, not counting the two foot horns atop her head. Her fingers now ended in sharp black talons. Her eyes turned completely red and her teeth sharpened into fangs. Revelry in the dark. Dark shadow cackled. Hush, my twin. Tokoyami chided his shadowy sister. Fumikage Tokoyami. The bird-headed teen replied. Fumikage Kira. His shadow replied softly. My conjoined twin is the social one. Please leave me be. She is weakened by bright lights. She can be a right menace in the dark. Tokoyami admitted. I know a good bookstore not far from here. Wanna come along later? Riaiko asked softly. As the dark powers will it. The raven-headed teen nodded, thankful his feathers covered the blush he was experiencing. Hey, no talking. Aizawa ordered, barely reacting as a gust of wind from Charlie throwing the ball blew his hair everywhere. The device he carried beeped once more. 666 meters. With a frown, he turned to Charlie. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Did what on purpose? Charlie asked in confusion before snorting a laugh when Aizawa showed her the screen. Nope, but that's funny. She giggled. Aizawa rolled his eyes at how immature she was acting before waving her off. Rikido Soto, you're up next. Aizawa sighed. He already regretted getting out of bed this morning. It was going to be a long day. Elsewhere. In a seedy rundown pub, a blue-haired man covered in hands growled in anger as he slammed his now dissolving handheld console onto the table. Fuck. Language. 
chitted what could only be described as purple smoke in a suit. Here, I'll grab the sack of games. They offered as they pulled a large bag out from under the counter and started rummaging through it. Game Boy, PSP, Xbox handheld, PS8, Nintendo Move. Huh. When did a puzzle cube get put in here? Puzzle cube. Fuck it. I'm almost out of batteries anyway. The blue-haired man sighed in agitation as he scratched at his neck. Where did you steal it? With a shrug, the mist man pulled out a small intricately carved puzzle cube plated with gold. You know, I can't quite remember. They mused before going back to cleaning the bar. From the looks of it, maybe one of those art collectors you killed the other week who said your art wasn't up to snuff. Fuck them. My art is gorgeous. The blue-haired man raged as he pointed at a crudely done finger painting of himself standing on a dead all might. Now hand me the fucking cube, will you, or will I have to die of boredom? Mina groaned as she flopped onto her back in the middle of the grass. Besides her, Izuku and Tokoyami and Kira were doing the same. The only two still going at the current test endurance laps were Momo and Charlie. Momo had made an electric scooter and Charlie was hopped up on two liters of sugary hot chocolate from that morning and Aizawa was starting to get annoyed. How is she still going? The ginger-haired girl, Itsuka Kendo panted as she hunched over breathing deeply. She had made a total of 23 laps before exhausting herself while Charlie and Momo were on lap 72. Such mad revelry. Tokoyami groaned from the spot he had laid down. He had made it barely 16 laps before he had to stop. Coincidentally, it was in the shade. His sister was simply cackling at the sight of Charlie zipping around the track like she had too much caffeine. All right, pack it in, Aizawa shouted, now officially bored of the test. You proved your point. With a skip in her step, Charlie quickly made her way back to the main group of students, most of who were lounging around in the shade of the few trees that lined the field. The only ones not lying in the shade were the frog-like girl Tsuyu Asui and Mina who were lying in the sun and Shoto Todoroki who had face-blinted just to the side of the track and proceeded to half-freeze himself to cool off. Finally, Aizawa muttered to himself as he pressed the Compile Results button on the measuring device. I'm not going to go over everything individually, so here are your results. He droned before with a press of another button. The results showed up on the main view monitor that hung above the field and was used for events like the sports festival. In first place was Charlie, who had only really failed the side jumps after she tripped over her own feet 20 seconds in. Tied for second was Shoto and Momo. Izuku somehow managed to grab third place by a mere two points, which he gained during the ball throw managing 666M like Charlie. Of course, Aizawa had threatened to expel both him and Charlie if they managed to pull that number as a result again, much to most of the class's confusion. Fourth was Bakugo. The blonde hadn't taken it well, obviously, but a glare from Aizawa was enough to keep him in check for now. Eventually, all the way down in last place was Toru Hagakure, the girl with an invisibility quirk. She was on her knees crying softly, certain she would be sent home, while Tsu and Ochako tried to comfort her. By the way, nobody is expelled. It was all a logical ruse to make you perform better. Aizawa stated blandly as he tucked himself away in his sleeping bag. Thank God, Toru sobbed with relief as she hugged Tsu tightly. The frog girl merely croaked in shock before shrugging. Down in hell, a grape-haired demon who was being tortured by an irate Luna, who he tried to grope, sneezed. It was rather obvious that's a lie, Sensei. You expelled your entire class last year. Momo pointed out, having heard about what happened to the previous class from Recovery Girl the night her parents died. What? Toru shrieked, making Tsu flinch due to how close she was. Nobody here has zero potential. 
That said, Aizawa frowned severely as he glared at the students. You all better shape up. The only ones who have to hold back for safety reasons are Midoriya who could incinerate us all and Todoroki who could freeze us all. That said, I expect tighter control from both of you. Hatsum, why the hell you aren't in the support class is beyond me, but if another of your inventions explode in my face, you're expelled. Huh? The pink dreadlocked girl grunted as she barely looked up from her latest baby that looked like some sort of metal boot mixed with a hair dryer. And pay attention, Aizawa snapped in agitation. Sure, sensei. She waved him off absently. Bloody rodent mixing up class rosters. Aizawa grumbled quietly enough that only Jiru heard him. Nezu had apparently decided to mix which students went into which course much to the agitation of most teachers. Some sparkly French kid had been moved from the hero course to business. His class gained Shinsu. Vlad had gained Ibarra due to his bribe backfiring. Nimiri had a boy called Siro in her class, after he was originally slated for his own and power loader had gained an overly competitive kid called Tetsutetsu Tetsutetsu in the support class. So, a uh, what now? Jiru asked uncertainly as her ear jacks clicked against one another. Now you brats will grab your work packs from homeroom and head home. You'll all be moving into the dorms tomorrow, and I expect you to be able to do it yourselves as I won't be holding your hands. Aizawa stated bluntly as he pulled out a juice box and started drinking. Where does he even get those? Shoji asked in confusion. Ooh, kinky. Miss joke, son. Please don't pray to my dad. Kinda weird for me. Charlie stated before going back to the phone call. I'll get the ice. Izuku offered as he opened the freezer only to get deadpanned at by everyone as the air extinguished his skull and knocked him over. His flames tend to do that when in contact with ice unless he's flaring his fire. Vaggy explained as she stepped over Aizawa to grab the ice herself. No clue why he seems to keep forgetting the fact. Maybe because he was quirkless and not used to his powers, Momo replied. The amount of things he had to deal with are astounding. Honestly, it's a wonder he didn't snap and kill half his old class using the things in the science labs. Explain now. Aizawa ordered from his spot on the floor only to wince in both pain and annoyance as Miss Joke decided to lay down next to him and cuddle his arm as Vaggy put a bag of ice on his shoulder to try and numb the pain. The blonde Pomeranian with the attitude problem wasn't the only one to bully him. Honestly, that school needs to be investigated and shut down. Vaggy scoffed disdainfully as she folded her arms and the HSC wants him to attend Y again. Aizawa groaned tiredly as Charlie hung up the phone. She's on her way now with Nezu. The blonde explained as she pulled a pot from the cupboard, turned it upside down and propped up Izuku's feet with it. How did you get the music to play so that only Izuku and Momo could hear it? What music? Miss Joke asked in confusion, making Momo's eyes widen in fear. Seriously, what music? Oh fuck me. Momo whimpered as she curled into a ball on the floor, clutching at her chest. Random weapons dripped from her skin and fell to the floor. Daggers, switch blades, swords, tasers and maces, the list went on. Nobody was able to get close to her, however, for fear of being accidentally stabbed or cut by the weapons. They could only watch on in horror, as the weapons were starting to come out no longer clean. Streaks of blood or sections of ripped-off skin adorned the blades as cuts opened up across her skin. Oh my cane, what the fuck? Vaggy uttered in horror. Charlie was already hunched over a garbage can and vomiting, while Ibarra was trying to stop herself from lunging forwards, just to lick the blades clean of any blood. What's happening? Aizawa demanded. I can't see shit, so tell me what's happening. Her quirk is out of control. Faggy replied quickly. She is literally having a panic attack, 
and she is going to bleed herself to death. Damn it. I don't know how to help here. If I use my quirk, it could just make it worse. Miss Joke gulped as she pulled herself away from Aizawa and stood up. Stay there, Zawa. I'm going to run outside and grab Recovery Girl quicker than she can walk. Damn it, get back here. Aizawa shouted at the retreating back of the clown-themed hero. Damn that woman. Aye, it hurts. Momo groaned in pain as tears ran down her face. SHH, it'll be okay. Ibarra shushed the sobbing teen as she wrapped her in a hug, wincing in pain as a blood-stained knife sliced down her lower leg as it fell to the floor. Recovery girl will be here soon. It burns! Momo screamed in pain as what could only be described as a trio of techno-organic blades forced themselves out of each of her forearms, her flesh hanging from the blades for the lower quarter as blood tripped down them at a gradually slower rate. Okay, either your quirk is broken or it has evolved. Charlie gave a strained smile as she tried to comfort the black-haired girl. Look on the bright side though, now nobody can tie you up. Out of the way, old lady coming through. Miss Joke cried as she sprinted back in with recovery girl slung over one shoulder and Nezu riding on her other. Put me down, recovery girl snapped as she whacked her cane over Miss Joke's arm before being let down. What happened? she demanded as she made her way around the room. Problem child knocked himself out. I have a broken collarbone and Yeyuruso had a panic attack and her quirk is acting weird. Aizawa explained from his place on the floor. You didn't move, did you? Recovery girl growled at the underground hero. I'm not risking another cane to the face. Aizawa stated bluntly as he glared at the old woman. Last time he had moved after breaking a bone that hadn't been either set or death with Recovery Girl had left him with a nasty bruise and a ringing in his ear after she was done yelling at him for being stupid. You better not. Ryosuri Girl huffed as she kissed the hobo hero on his forehead. With no time at all Aizawa was out cold and with a healed collarbone. Seeing there was nothing further that could be done for Izuku given his feet were already propped up, she moved on to Momo who was still shaking, and now rather pale form blood loss. Look, she's here now. Ibarra tried to soothe Momo while using her vines to collect up any and all weapons that the girl was making. Hmm, looks like a simple case of panic-based quirk activation. Give her some time to calm down and she'll be alright. Recovery girl hummed. As for her lacerations, I can fix that now. Leaning down, she placed a kiss on the black-haired girl's head only to frown when nothing happened. Odd. What's odd? Momo asked in worry. Nothing you need to worry your head about, dearie. Just want you in my office for observation tonight if it's okay. Recovery girl asked politely before frowning as she tried to check Momo's wrist for her pulse. Her expression began to grow worried when she couldn't find a pulse on the girl's neck either. Oh my. Nezu hummed to himself as he strolled over. Been a while since I saw this in person. What in person you damned rodent? Vaggy growled in annoyance. Come on, let's all just get along, after all inside every demo. Charlie pleaded only for Ibarra to wrap a vine around her mouth to silence the song before it began. Nezu merely grinned widely with an unsettling cackle before he replied, Well, the creation of a Cenobite, of course. Heaven. Cherub was in full swing, making their usual preparatory work before a job, mostly dumping it all on Colin while the others relaxed. What they had sadly overlooked during this all, however, was a teeny tiny little detail of do not approach and danger stamp on the file of the one they wanted heaven bound. If only Colin, Keeney, and Cletus hadn't been sent to hell with it would have been a simple task to notice. Sadly, things were about to take a turn for the worse for Cherub during their visit to one individual who's most commonly known by their pseudonym of Hero Killer. 
Thank you all for watching and what you want next tell me here for idea. Bye boys.